Good morning, Mayor. <coughs> Good morning, Representative Rivera. He's consenting. Good morning, Ms. Prime. We do have a quorum. Yes, sir. Good morning. This is an agenda review meeting of the El Paso City Council for Monday, March 25th, 2024. It is 9.01 a.m. Mayor Lisa is present and presiding inside council chambers along with Mayor Pro Tem Kennedy, Alternate Mayor Pro Tem Molinar, Representative Salcido, Representative Fierro, and Representative Rivera. Mayor, we have a quorum. Thank you. If we could stand for the pledge, please. Yes, sir. Chief D'Agostino, can you lead us in the pledge, sir? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, sir. Ms. Prine, we're ready to go. Yes, sir. On the agenda this morning is the agenda review for the March 26, 2024 regular city council meeting. And at the conclusion of this meeting, we will be convening a council work session. We begin agenda review with item number three. Good morning, sir. Good morning, uh, Mayor and Council. Sam Rodriguez, Director of the Airport. Item number three is the First Amendment between the city and SFPP, one of the pipeline uh, holders at an airport. This is to amend the easement uh, to clarify the termination, which will be June 19, 2043. Thank you. Item number four, which is Chief Talamantes. We'll go to item five and then we'll come back to four. Thank you. Item five. Is there an item five or no? No, oh, hold on. He's coming up. Good morning, Assistant Chief Briones. Good item morning, number four, uh, a resolution authorizing the city manager or designee to submit grant application 2998210 for the city of El Paso Police Department project identified as local border security program fiscal year 25. <clears throat> Through the public office of the state of Texas, including our related paperwork, including but not limited to authorization of budget transfers and or revisions to the operation plan and to accept, <coughs> excuse me, reject, amend, and terminate 
and or terminate the grant, which will provide financial assistance to the city of El Paso. In the event of loss or misuse of grant funds, the city of El Paso assures that it will return the funds to the public safety office in full, requesting 500 and, uh, 550,000 no cash match required. Grant period will be from September 1st, 2024 to, uh, through August 31st, 2025. Thank you, sir. Item five. Mayor, item, f item five is uh, an in she's coming up. Yeah, yeah, Sorry about that, Mayor Council. Item five is the uh, interlocal cooperation agreement between Department of Public Safety, State of Texas, City of El Paso, and this is in regards to the failure to appear system. The resolution and amendment is to add the contract changes by the Department of Public Safety mandated by the 88th legislator. This includes inclusion of indenture as mandated by House Bill. It also includes the option to acquire an occupational license with the license on hold for two years plus an additional two years. The change to policy clarity regarding specific responsibilities held by each party and language to account for future changes. Thank you, sir. Item six is uh, solid waste lanes. Item seven is Good morning, Mayor and Council. This is Maria Pasillas. Good morning, ma'am. Item seven is a resolution on a waiver of penalty and interest, and this is due to postal service error. Uh, the taxpayer has met all of the requirements, and the total amount being waived is $23,274.17. The next item, number eight, is also a waiver of penalty and interest, and this one is due to uh, tax office error. Um, the taxpayer has met all of the requirements, and the total amount being waived is $474.40. The next item, number nine, is another waiver of penalty and interest, and it's also due to tax office error, and the taxpayer has met all of the requirements, and the total amount being waived is $366.55. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Item 10, please. Good morning, Mayor and Council. Joaquin Rodriguez with Capital Improvements. Item 10 is an advanced funding agreement with Texas Department of Transportation for railroad crossing improvements at Piedras. There is no city match. Thank you, sir. Item 11. Item 11 is an advanced funding agreement with TxDOT for railroad crossing improvements at Zaragoza. Uh, again, there is no city match. Thank you, sir. Item 12. Good morning, Nicole Rodriguez with Community Human Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Item 12 is a resolution to authorize the city manager to sign the documents related to the Environmental Protection Agency's Climate Pollution Reduction Grant. Implementation grants, general competition, and any agreements and verifications required to apply for this grant on April 1st, 2024. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Item uh, 14 and 15 is board appointments. Item 16. Good morning, Nicole Cody, Managing Director. Item 16 is the PCAR transactions for notations for both the Mayor, Council, City Manager, and City Attorney's Office and staff. Okay, and then item 17 through 293, I think it's from Representative Molinor. Campaign donations through item 25. So we'll go to item 26. And for the record, Representatives Hernandez and Canales are also present in Council Chambers. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Mayor, Council. I am Rhonda Easter, representing Purchasing and Strategic Sourcing. For item 26, the strategic goal for this item is number two. The linkage to the strategic plan is subsection 2.3. This is a replacement contract and request for qualifications procurement. There were a total of 11 viewers online. Three proposals were received, two being local vendors. There were no protests received for this requirement. We're requesting award of solicitation 2024 0151R, Stress Management to Integrity Employee Assistance Inc., DBA Well Connect, the highest ranked offerer based on the evaluation factors established in the evaluation criteria for this procurement. Thank you, ma'am. You're welcome. 
Okay, items. Okay, uh, items 27 through 33 are council items. So now we go to call to the public. No, um, item 34, first reading. And for the record, Representative Acevedo is also present. We Good morning, Mayor, Council, Raul Garcia, Planning and Inspections. Items 34 is the first reading of an ordinance rezoning property to SD Special Development. This is for 2607 Montana. This would allow a new professional business office. There is no opposition. City Plan Commission was unanimous approval. Okay, 35. Item 35, also first reading of an ordinance uh, rezoning property to C1 Commercial. This is for 319 and 323 North Zaragoza. Uh, this would allow a new retail shopping center. We did receive two emails in support and CPC was unanimous approval. Thank you, sir. 36. Good afternoon, Derek Ross with the Good morning, though. Sourcing Department, good morning, Mayor. <laughs> She should go for this item is goal number four, enhance El Paso's quality of life through recreational, cultural, and educational environments. The Lincoln Strategic Plan is subjection 4.1. This is a competitive sale procurement for 2024-0039 Komodo Dragon Exhibit Improvements. There were 18 views online, three bids were received, all coming from local suppliers, no protests were received for this requirement, and we are recommending an award as indicated to Mitterdor Enterprises Inc., the highest ranked offer based on the evaluation factors for this procurement. Thank you, sir. 37. Good morning. Good morning. Edward Rodriguez with Purchasing and Strategic Sourcing. Item 37, the strategic goal, strategic goal for this item is number four, enhance El Paso's quality of life through recreational, cultural, and educational environments. The linkage to the strategic plan is subsection 4.2. This is a new contract for barricade services for the Parks and Recreation Department. This is a low bid procurement. There were 27 views online. Two bids were received, two being local suppliers. No protest was received for this requirement. We are recommending to award to Contractors Barricade Service Incorporated, DBA Apache Barricade and Strain, the lowest responsive responsible bidder. Thank you, sir. 38. Good morning. Good morning, sir. John Scott with Purchasing and Strategic Sourcing. Item 38, the strategic goal for this item is number four, enhance El Paso's quality of life through recreational, cultural, and educational environments. The linkage to the strategic plan is subsection 4.2, create innovative recreational and educational and cultural programs. This non-competitive procurement is under local government general exemption, section 252.022, Three, a procurement necessary because of unforeseen damage to public machinery, equipment, or other property. This procurement is for hardwood chips made from maple and alder to protect city property to include the well-being of animals. And we're recommending award to Bark Boys, Inc. for a two-year term. Thank you, sir. Yes, ma'am. Representative Hernandez. I just don't see the funding source on this item. Um, are you able to tell me the, where the funding is coming for, for this project, please? Um, Yes, ma'am, this is coming from the zoo's operating fund. Mm -hmm. Item 39, please. Good morning, morning Derek again. Russell with Purchasing Strategic Sourcing again. Just goal for this item is goal number seven, enhance the sustainable El Paso's infrastructure network. Linked to subsection 7.2, improve competitiveness through infrastructure improvements impacting the quality of life. This is a new contract for security guard services for city parks. This contract will start April 2024. This is a best value procurement. There were 26 views online. Four bids were received, all coming from local suppliers. No protests were received for this requirement, and we are recommending an award to Night Eyes Protective Services, Inc., the highest ranked bidder, based on the evaluation factors for this procurement. Thank you, sir. Item 40. Good morning, Raul Garcia again, planning morning, inspections. Sir. Item 40 is the second reading of an ordinance rezoning property to C3 Commercial. This is for property at 1150 Vista de Oro Drive. This would allow a new public charter school. There is no opposition. Uh, we did receive one email and one phone call in support. City Plan Commission was approval on a five to two vote. Thank you, 41. 
Item 41 also is the second reading of an ordinance uh, rezoning property to A2 apartment. This is for 4707 Atlas. This would allow a new apartment development. Uh, we did receive one email in opposition. City Plan Commission was unanimous approval. Thank you. 42. And 42, also second reading of an ordinance, rezoning property to, property to AO Apartment Office. Uh, this is for 1165 Ranger Street. This would allow a new martial arts studio. Uh, we did get one phone call in opposition. City Plan Commission was unanimous approval. Thank you. 43. And 43 is a uh, second reading of an ordinance amending Title 15, the mobile billboard ordinance. This ordinance will terminate the existing pilot program and will make the mobile billboard uh, ordinance permanent. 44, please. Good morning. Good morning, Armida Martinez, Planning and Inspections. <laughs> Item 44 is a second reading of an ordinance granting a special privilege license to Centro de Salud Familiar de la Fe for the encroachment of existing plumbing infrastructure over city right-of-way. Thank you. Thank you. 45. Morning, Bill Allen with Economic and International Morning, Development. Sir. Item 45 is discussion and action on a resolution authorizing the city manager to sign a Chapter 380 Economic Development Agreement between the city and Eaton Corporation in support of a development located at 1 Helen of Troy Drive. The agreement uh, requires that the applicant to make a minimum investment of $70 million. Over the term of the agreement, the city shall provide economic incentives not to exceed $3,391,000 in the form of a property tax rebate, a development fee rebate, construction materials sales tax rebate, and a skills training grant. Now, this is um, a company that's uh, purchasing uh, the Helena Troy building. Would yes, that sir. be correct? Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning, Mr. Mayor and Council. I, I'm Adriana Pulesio with Economic Development. Item 46 links to goal number one and is for the discussion and action that the City of El Paso Council authorizes the submission and grant application, which requires no match from the city to the US EDA for the Distressed Area Recompete Pilot Program Phase 2 for the El Paso Recompete Network Program. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Item 47, which was postponed prior to. Yes, good morning, Sam Rodriguez, um, morning. Chief Operations Officer. We'll be providing the uh, City Council with a presentation on the MPC. Uh, this is an uh, item that has been postponed for the last two Council meetings. No questions. Thank you. Item 48. Good morning, Mayor and Council. Nicole Cody, Managing morning, Director. Ma this is a discussion and action that the City Manager or his or her designee be authorized to effectuate a budget transfer for the El Paso Police Department from their toll lot. And we do have a presentation uh, ready, <laughs> sir. Okay, for tomorrow. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Item 49. <clears throat> Good morning, Mayor and Council. Good morning, Rodriguez again, sir. For Yvette Hernandez. Item 49 is discussion and action on award of task order number two uh, in support of the Wainwright Park Phase 2 project to Keystone General Contractors LLC. Estimated award of $721,242.31. Uh, this project will complete the park to include a zip line, playground equipment, landscaping, resurfacing of the existing basketball court, and a new metal canopy. Thank you, sir. Item 50 and final item. That's right. <laughs> Good morning again, Thank Nicole you, Rodriguez, Community Human Development. Item 50 is a discussion in action to approve the appropriation of $3 million from the coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery funds portion of the grant funds. These funds are designated to support services addressing community vulnerability, including but not limited to ho housing, homelessness, family stability, household stability, and, and administrative expenses associated with the implementation of equity and diversity in response to COVID-19. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Ms. Prine. Yes, that brings us to the end of the agenda review meeting. May we have a motion to adjourn? There's a motion and a second to adjourn the agenda. Review meeting, all in favor? Anyone opposed? 
And the agenda review meeting for Monday, March 25th, 2024 is adjourned at 9.19 a.m. Mayor, would you like to convene the work session? Please, ma'am. Thank you, good morning. This is a work session of the El Paso City Council for Monday, March 25th, 2024. It is 9.19 a.m. Mayor Leeser is present and presiding in council chambers along with Mayor Pro Tem Kennedy, Representative Acevedo, Representative Hernandez, Alternate Mayor Pro Tem Molinar, Representative Salcido, Representative Fierro, Representative Rivera, and Representative Canales. We do have a quorum. Agenda item number one is discussion and action on an emergency ordinance extending emergency ordinance number 019333 authorizing the city manager to assign personnel and resources to assist in addressing the humanitarian and public safety crisis resulting from a mass migration through El Paso. Motion to adjourn. I mean, motion to second, approve. Second, Sorry. Second, <laughs> Sorry, motion to approve. <laughs> 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 Okay. No. <laughs> I want to thank you. I, I wanted. I'm going through the backup right now, and I'm trying to find um, the line item. I don't know if it's in this item or in the next item, where we had tried to pass a motion, but the overall motion died, which was to. Um, it's, the next item. It, it's on the next item. Uh, was yeah, that was language item included? Yes, it was. I'll I'll, I'll go back it was to on item two, ma'am. Yes. Okay. I'll hold my question. We have a motion and a second yes, for sir, item one. There's a motion made by Representative Rivera, seconded by Representative Fierro to approve <laughs> item number one. On that motion, call for the vote. Representative Fierro? Aye. Thank yes, you, Mayor. Do you Aye. consent? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. In the voting session, and that motion passes unanimously with the mayor's point. consent. Exclamation point. Item number two is discussion and action on an emergency ordinance extending a disaster declaration due to a humanitarian, security, and economic crisis resulting from mass migration waves through El Paso. Right, Representative Acevedo, please. Yeah, so a lot has happened in the last month, and I, I think that one of the things that I, I really appreciate is staff really um, answering a lot of different questions, uh, the two of you especially, and, and really um, I met with the regional director for DPS, and he answered some questions, and I, and I also um, met the city attorney, had many different conversations, and. Um, city manager and so I, I just have been doing a lot of that work since the last month um, since the since about last month I I still have a lot of concerns with this I, I think first and foremost I think this is not great governance and I feel that we could find a solution to this I think we're going to continue being in this situation and I think that a lot of my constituents have been telling me um, through community meetings, through calls, just different things that they don't feel the urgency of a state of emergency. And I, I think that um, for a lot of them, they said, you know, I felt the urgency of this during the COVID pandemic. It was very obvious. Things were shifting. Things were very different. And here we're in this perpetual state of emergency every 30 days for this indefinite amount of time that we just don't know when that's going to stop. I, I don't see it stopping anytime soon. Um, I think we're going to be in it for the long haul for, I'm talking years, not even weeks or months at this point. Um, I'm, I'm also thinking that um, we, we need to think of other practices that are here. I understand that we are not supposed to be in this position because the city um, is not supposed to be doing immigration stuff right and and I think that's been the failure of Congress for 30 years I think um, I, I take it very personally when they use our community for a political fo football that they're just throwing around and um, they like to do it every single election year like we have this year to make sure that immigration doesn't get addressed because it's such a, a great topic to go out to voters on um, I'm also thinking that um, 
we we need to make sure that um, we tell the public that this is not something that is tied to federal funding at all. Um, federal funding is not necessary. Like, we don't need this in place to get the federal funding. This is um, separate and apart from what DPS is doing, which is something that I think a lot of people are not very happy with, you know, these high-speed chases. Um, a lot of it, um, I think, has happened because the concertina wire that has been put in by the state has been along the border, and then it's sending all these people over to New Mexico, which then connects into El Paso on the west side, right, where a lot of these high-speed chases are happening. And so I think that that's really important to state, and I think that um, in, in the coming weeks, months and stuff, I, I want to continue having conversations about this. I, I want to um, meet with the, the state emergency management office as well to kind of have their understanding on what, what they're doing. I know that we have saved $15 million in September by, by doing the busing. I think that we have continued to have low numbers since January. None of our shelters are being used. And so I, I say all this that um, I, I just want to um, say that I'm begrudgingly going to support this, but um, I, I just want to state this as in I, I don't think this is a good solution for the long run. So um, I just wanted to throw all of that out because I know that um, a lot has happened in the past few weeks. So that's what I have for now. Thank you, sir. And I thank you for um, going out there. And I know that um, you spent a lot of time the last uh, two weeks or really four weeks talking to staff, city attorney, myself. I know you and I have met numerous times, and then we met with uh, the director for DPS. So uh, I, I do appreciate you taking your time to do that and understand what's going on. And, and you know, so thank you again for that. And with that, Representative Canales. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I know we, when we spoke about this a month ago, uh, we, I basically told you exactly what I was going to ask you for this time, which was uh, an accounting of what exactly this specifically allows us to do, this emergency ordinance. Um, I understand that this doesn't impact our ability to receive federal funds, but it does impact our ability to use those federal funds to uh, That's serve as our, uh, in our role essentially as the overflow sheltering for the NGOs. Is that correct? Correct. Are you able to provide a, you know, this, this does more things. There are more things listed, for example, in the, in the various clauses. Can you provide a little bit more of an accounting of what, what exactly it allows, allows us, us to, to do? To stand up and open up our emergency operations plan. So that's what allows us to do the sheltering, the feeding operations, and any of the numerous plans we do have. In the past month, we've, we've had to go ahead and house on, on at least four or five separate occasions. Uh, we utilize hotels with smaller numbers. We can do that. This allows us to activate that sheltering plan, which is allows us to put people into a mass shelter. So the school, when you look at Moorhead, it allows us to operate and stand up that. Uh, this also mentions, for example, the airport. Are there other things that this allows for uh, with regard to the airport or any other of our facilities? So with the airport, um, they've, have, you all remember, they've, they've seen some challenges, uh, especially when the numbers do go up and they have to modify their space. Um, so that there's language in there uh, on, on them having to work within the FAA guidelines to, to be able to still manage the, op the airport uh, when we see these, these influxes. Do you recall when the last time we had any change at the airport was? It's been quite a while now, correct? The, the, a, a change to the normal operations. 15 right. months ago. It's been it was about 15 months ago. It's been a while. Okay. Um, again, it's, uh, I, I, trust me, uh, understand and, 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 and share people's uh, frustration and, and rightful anger, I think, with some of the actions that we've seen from DPS regarding chases, some other things that are unrelated to this emergency ordinance. Uh, this is what is allowing us to to uh, open up our shelter space when we need to and provide relief to the NGOs. Um, and so it's very important that we don't leave the community without that, that capability from the city. Yes, sir. Thank and you, one step further, and also gives us the ability to help the NGOs right. and uh, send some of the people that we have designated from the city that move over to. So uh, thank you for that. Yes, sir. 
Representative uh, Hernandez. Thank you, Mayor. Um, the second document, it does include it, but I do want to read again to emphasize to the public that um, the OEM for the City of El Paso and the County of El Paso is in full control of the response. And that last segment of the um, whereas in the document states, whereas this document continues the activation of the city emergency management plans and therefore reflects the authority of the city of El Paso's OEM and the handling of the local mass migration response and is separate and apart from any authority possessed by any other jurisdiction, including other local, state, and federal agencies. While you all are in control, I think it's really important to note that you, you all have a very seamless and open communication with all of the other bodies, and, and we appreciate that. Now, the concerns we've heard from Representative Canales and Representative Acevedo, they're not unfounded. And we are hearing that over and over again about the concerns of uh, car, um, high-speed car chases. Um, a couple weeks ago, I had the chief for the El Paso sector, Chief Good, at one of my community meetings, and I would be remiss if I didn't explain what our constituents were concerned about and what they would like to see. And I don't know if it's through this emergency um, declaration here or if it's working with other nonprofits, but there was a consensus that there was a lot of misinformation now with the unconstitutional SB4, Texas Lone Star, uh, Operation Lone Star immigration law. Um, that misinformation has permeated the entire, um, all of the migrants who are making their way here. There's a lot of panic. The, the result ultimately is there's panic, there's confusion from uh, migrants on the other side, refugees, asylum seekers, and now out of desperation you were seeing what we saw last week in the news, which is that um, push through uh, the National Guardsmen who have no experience uh, or no training responding to um, immigration concerns like federal agents are. And so I'm really concerned about uh, the residents along the border. Um, my sister is a teacher at a uh, elementary school right next to the border and the entire school was put on lockdown. This isn't sustainable. And what I have heard from my constituents is that they would like to see more uh, proactive communication with the residents along the border. And if there is a way to communicate with folks on the other side of the border through the organizations and the networks like clearing the record on what this means. No, immigration laws have not changed. No, um, you're not going to have, uh, you know, migrants or undocumented folks or, or, or those other folks. You're not going to be responsible for where they go next. Who do you call? And so the, the Paso Norte Health Foundation has the Prometoras program where they're helping make communities more inclusive and they're going door to door. Uh, that is what my constituents are asking for, for a more comprehensive outreach um, so that we can notify residents on what happens when someone's at your door, because that is happening. What happens when someone jumps in your backyard? That's what's happening. Who do you call? Well, folks may call 911, but you know we're already pressed and taxed uh, with limited resources. So what else can we do? Um, on the other side of the the wall, you know, is there anybody you know actively letting them know that everything is still on pause? There's a lot of uh, fluidity and volatility with this discussion, and uh, as a result, you're seeing panic and desperation because folks think that this is their time or now, now or never. Uh, and so I don't know what proactive measures that we can instill, but I, I wanted to make sure that I communicated that on behalf of my constituents. Thank you, ma'am. And I think um, it was really important when uh, I was with uh, Representative Acevedo and uh, he met with uh, Mr. Sanchez from DPS, she made a commitment to Representative Acevedo yeah. that uh, he would start uh, being more proactive and, and letting us know what their actions are and what they're doing, it. And, um, and we'll hold them accountable for that because I think that was really important based on what you were saying, that he had committed to Representative Acevedo that he would share that with all of us. Representative Acevedo? Oh, you're, you're not on there anymore. Thank you very much. With that, do we have a motion? We have a motion and a second. Yes, Mayor, we also have public comment. Yes, ma'am. We have Yvonne Diaz. Ms. Diaz, star six, please, to unmute your telephone. Yvonne Diaz, good morning. You have three minutes. Good morning, dear Mayor. Uh, good morning. Council. My, name is, my name is Yvonne Diaz, and I want to urge the City Council and, and Mayor Lister this morning to cut all ties Cooperation Lone Star and to refrain from re renewing the emergency declaration. 
I invite you to take a firm stand against xenophobic tactics such as SB4 and Operation Lone Star in order to foster a safe and inclusive environment for all residents of our city. The emergency declaration started in December 2022 to protect people from the cold weather and have extra patrols in some of the El Paso streets. Now, on February 26, 2024, this year, it was stated that by the emergency management office that there was no longer an overflow at the shelters. And looking at the migration, migrant situational awareness dashboard created by the city of El Paso, the numbers have not increased significantly. And also on the same day uh, in February, it was stated that without the declaration, we cannot assist them with housing and more head will be closed. However, in January 11, 2024, Mayor Lister, you reported at a press conference that the city was closing the shelter because of the low numbers. And if Moorhead is closed and numbers are low compared to December 2022, why do we continue to need the emergency declaration? I also want to emphasize that the city has been able to get federal reimbursements and provide transportation and shelter since before this declaration was put in place. Please vote no against emergency declaration in order to cut ties with Operation Lone Star and create a more safe and inclusive environment for all residents. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Ellen Lizarraga. Ellen Lizarraga. Don't believe he's in attendance. That concludes public comment on this item. Thank you, Ms. Pern. There is a motion. We have a motion and a second. Yes, sir, there's a motion made by Representative Rivera, seconded by Representative Canales, to approve item number two. On that motion, call for the vote. Mayor, do you consent? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. In the voting session, and the motion passes unanimously. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Chiefs. That brings us to item number three, and this is a budget update on the five-year financial forecast. Good, <clears throat> good morning, Mayor and Council, Nicole Cody, Managing Director of the Office of Management and Budget. Good morning, Mayor. We'll go ahead and get started. If IT can please bring up the presentation. All right, so today we're going to talk about our multi-year financial forecast. So here we'll also be going over the budget calendar as well as Robert will be covering our debt service. And we will be launching Chime In and the Council budget requests. So just to start with a 2024 budget recap. Some of the significant investments that this council has approved, of course, are going to be part of public safety, our continued investment in our workforce, and addressing our facilities and our vehicles. So here you can see the budget process timeline. So we started uh, last month in, with the first quarter financial report and we'll continue through August to the budget adoption. So we need to focus as part of the strategic planning session, there's been a focus on long-term financial responsibility and sus sustainability and how do we get there. It's important that we continue to ensure that we're looking at both short-term and long-term projections. So the tools that we have used in the past include are both our PAYGO funding as well as continuous improvement processes. So our strategic objectives continue to be our investment in public safety, ensuring that we are funding the operation and maintenance of the quality of life bond facilities, as well as the 2019 public safety bond facilities. And as I mentioned, we continue to focus on our investments both with public safety, both fire and police, their vehicle equipment replacement, our workforce investments, as well as our capital project funding. So here's an overview of the 2024 budget, and this is broken down by category. And you can see 71% of personal services, or $408 million, $406 million, sorry, is going to personal services. So the largest majority of our budget is for people, with 70% represented by public safety. 
And then again, this is general fund only, and goal number two being public safety at 57.7%. So when we look at developing our budget, we continue to have to find a balance. We're looking at minimizing our impact to our taxpayers while ensuring that we're providing the, the goods and services that our community expects. So the future outlook, we're gonna go ahead and jump right into the five-year financial forecast. So this long-range forecast, it's really important to remember that it's a planning tool. It allows us to look into the future based on current actuals that we're seeing today and um, being able to project where we would be financially over the next five years. Please note that these numbers shown today are all estimates and they are subject to change and of course subject to council's adoption. So first we're going to look at property valuations and we'll go into detail on the revenues for your property values as well as sales tax. And then we're gonna highlight the expanding services that we see throughout the organization. So the multi-year financial outlook is going to cover FY 2025 through 2029. I'll go over briefly the methodology as well as the assumptions that are covered as part of this plan. So first we're gonna look at our economic outlook. So the national GDP continues to have a strong and positive growth. And if you look at El Paso based on the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas for their Metropolitan Business Cycle Index, El Paso actually rebounded in the third quarter of last year, indicating that we continue to weather the slowdown that we saw in manufacturing across the country and across this continent. In addition, we have seen, based on UTEP's El Paso Household Economic Stress Index, however, a decline in retail sales. And the reason is, is there's, as the index continues to go up, there's a hesitancy from consumers to be able to spend because they're uncertain on what's gonna happen in our economy. However, our unemployment continues to remain relatively low at 4.6% and could, should help to prevent any additional uh, reductions in retail sales by our local okay. consumer. We have a hot mic, please mute yourself. Consumer price index, 12 month percentage change, that first gray area that you see is the Great Recession. The next area that you see high, highlighted or in gray is going to be COVID-19. Then you can see the spike that we all have experienced over the past four years and um, the fluctuation that we've seen over the past two. So as we jump into the multi-year financial forecast, this represents, this graph represents both the revenues and the expenditures for each area in each year. So you're gonna look at it, you're gonna say, well, the, Nicole, the gap is not very large this year. And the reason for that is how we approached our property tax projections. And we'll get into more detail on that, but you'll see in the first year a $7.1 million variance projected for 2025. And that really is due to property tax because we're holding the O&M rate the same and the valuation is changing. So the property tax is covering the majority of that gap. And then in 2026, 2027 is where it spikes at a $7.8 million gap. And then you'll notice in 28 and 29, it really seems to close. So here's the actual detail information for both the revenues and the expenditures. And so I want to take pause here so you can see that $7.1 million variance is at the very bottom on the very last column. And what it, we're doing is we're subtracting, of course, our revenues from minus our expenditures is what's providing that, and that's that deficit that we're looking at or that gap you saw on the previous slide. So in 2025, again, the gap we're estimating at $7.1 million, 5.8, <clears throat> excuse me, 5.8 million, then $7.8 million, and then as I mentioned, it does level off at about $2.2 million and $1.2 million variance between our revenues and our expenditures. Oh, thank you so much. <clears throat> We're going to get into more detail in later slides, but I want to make sure that you know that this includes the impact of the collective bargaining agreement that was approved for the El Paso Police Department. It includes assumptions for the El Paso Fire Department uh, collective bargaining agreement, as well as for the additional academies, the civilian compensation increases, which we'll go into detail, as well, of course, the O&M for both the 2012 Quality of Life bonds, um, even though there we have very few projects left, and the 2019 Public Safety Bond projects. 
so revenues. So as I mentioned for the property taxes, the way we approached it is we held the O&M the same. So there's multiple vari variables when determining your property tax rate. So included in that is both your valuation and the rate itself, correct? And so with this, with the property valuation growth, we're looking at for FY 2025 is an estimate of 7.5%. And we'll see that in a later slide. <clears throat> As I mentioned, the O&M rate stays the same, and then we continue to see um, revenue loss through our exemptions. The other areas we're going to focus on are going to be our sales tax growth, as well as the international bridge crossings. So 48% of the overall general fund revenue is, comes from property tax, with sales tax being our next highest at 232 Here's the property tax valuations, as I mentioned. Here we have the historical. Um, everything in orange is going to be a reappraisal year. We did uh, hear from our central appraisal district, and they will be doing another reappraisal, and so we're still estimating a high 7.5% for FY 2025, and then we're looking at dropping that down around 4 Point six to 4.10. We also know that we have residential property cap uh, that was imposed at the 10% rate for last year, and it's going to be a 20% for non-residential properties going to the next year. And so we want to make sure we're also taking that valuation into, fact, into consideration for the future years. So this is what the property tax rate looks like. So this is really in order for you to be able to have a comparison and for modeling purposes so we can see what happens to the rate if we keep the O&M rate based on the debt service projection that Mr. Cortinez is going to provide. So here you'll see that the rate is going to stay relatively flat. We will have a reduction to the rate in um, 2025 due to the debt service and then it'll go up slightly in 2026 and then 2027 as issuances are made. So property tax relief, this is important property tax relief to our residents, to our community, but we need to remember that it is revenue loss to the general fund. So as we continue uh, to have these exemptions, you'll see that we had $37.7 million relief in 2024, which was a revenue that was not going to the general fund. Here's a breakdown of the increases that council has approved for the over 65 uh, and disabled homesteads. So now let's look at sales tax. So sales tax, as you know, and we've talked about, is that there is a delay in receiving the data from the state. We've seen the impact of inflation on our sales tax. It reflects similar to what we saw through the CPI as far as the growth in sales tax as well. Now we're seeing as inflation is low to moderate, and we continue to see sustained higher interest rates, we're also seeing, as I mentioned in the stress index, that consumers are a little uncertain, uncertain about our economy. And so then they reduce their spending as well. So this type of slowdown is still continued to be expected in 2024. We are not forecasting, and as you've seen in the national news, they're not forecasting a recession either. Um, but we are seeing possible slowdown in job growth and forecasted um, spending. So here's our sales tax and our projection as was provided in the first quarter projection. So we still continue to see that we're right on target with the adopted 2024 budget. And then this is what it looks like on a month to month basis for the past, well, long time. So here you'll see the Great Recession as well as the COVID-19 and then the moving average. So we did a six month moving average just to show so you could see while the sales tax is increasing on the revenue side, the overall growth, we're starting to see a slight decline. This is the projected sales tax through August of 2029, and you'll see that we are taking into account that there's gonna be very slow to moderate growth coming up in the next fiscal year, and then we start to see just our normal growth patterns moving forward. So bridge transfer revenue. So we originally had projected $16.5 million of, for the adopted in 2024, but instead we're projecting close to 16. So what we're seeing on international bridges is we have seen a slight decrease in vehicle, trans, uh, vehicle transportation, as well as a reduction in February for our cargo traffic. Expenditures. So uniforms, 
Salaries and benefits, of course, represent a large portion of our overall general fund expenditures. And then here you'll see the breakdown of both uniform, our civilian salaries, and then our operating costs. So public safety, since it is our largest component of our budget, uh, we are looking at the investment that we've made over the years. Since 2026, we've seen an investment of $109.3 million, or a 50% increase. So we continue to, for the police department, to work on staffing. We had the Net 30 pro uh, Promise initiative that was started, but we did see a, a decline during COVID, and then now the issues we're seeing and being able to recruit for the classes. So the police department continues to have new initiatives. They continue to tackle it. Um, and we are seeing a slight reduction in or projecting a slight reduction for our 2024 staffing, but we're hoping the department will be able to continue to rebound. Here you'll see what I mean as far as um, attrition. So the attrition amount are the number of retirements that we see on the forest, and then the new officers reflect the new academies, and we're still projecting a net growth, though a negative net growth of nine. Starting in 2025, we hope to see positive growth back to the police department. So it's taken us a little longer than we anticipated to be able to rebound. Here you'll see the number of recruits that we're projecting, and please remember this includes the, also the academy that just graduated um, last week. So here's the average age and the current officers eligible for retirement both this year in and in 2025. This always stays top of mind for us as we continue to project um, because we do have a large number that are eligible to retire. So future impacts continue to be our collective bargaining agreement, our staffing plan, as I mentioned, and you can see what we're doing and how we're projecting to continue to increase our staffing on the police department, as well as the public safety bond operating costs and our continued investment in crisis intervention team. So this is the projected impact that we have for FY 2025. We're projecting to see an increase of $9.8 million. We'll continue to see um, three small academies throughout the year. We're hoping to see 35 graduates in each academy for the El Paso Police Department. For the fire department, we're seeing a moderate increase as well as we'll continue to see two academies with at least 45 graduates each year to be ready to open Fire Station 38. Here's the breakdown of their actual budgets for the, including the new academies based on our projections. So here you'll see <clears throat> investment in public safety. So the average fleet of a fire, average, sorry, average price of a fire truck has gone up. So this is, we're not looking at uh, Quint, but this is just your fire truck as well as the average price of a police car. We've gone from on average 65,000, of course that includes fully loaded to 95,000 to 100,000 per vehicle. So we'll continue to see our general fund investment uh, for replacement, radio player replacement, vehicle replacement, as well as continue to leverage grants where we can. <clears throat> this is a, just listing of the bond projects that are coming up and including the operation and maintenance that was originally presented back in 2019. We continue with this plan that was provided to the community and is at work, we work with the department to be able to bring this to fruition for both the police department and the fire department. So here are the enhanced programs that we've seen in the El Paso Police Department since 2016 to include the Animal Cruelty Unit, the Downtown Metro Unit, and our CIT. So the staffing needs beyond the plan, the Net 30 plan. So we're barely getting back on the plan, hopefully in 2025, but we know we need to exceed that. So there's additional of a of 200 plus positions that we need to be able to add to the police department staffing over the next five to 10 years. In addition to that, this shows you those staffing needs based on the public safety bond, as well as what's been discussed for the body worn camera. These, some of these positions have already been put in place. And then now for the El Paso Fire Department. <clears throat> 
we continue with 988 FTEs. Uh, we're looking at, we have already added the open last fall, State Fire Station 36. We're going to be adding 31 firefighters for Fire Station 38 and three additional for just the training academy. Here you can see the additional academies that we will have coming up in, as part of 2024. Civilian workforce. So here are the compensation assumptions. And so these are really important. And it's important that we note that these are only assumptions. And so we, of course, took in, uh, into consideration, council made the motion that has a resolution in order to reach $15 by FY20, by 2026, I think is what it says. I was going to add the word FY, but it's by 2026. So with this initial assumptions, you're going to see as part of 2025, so that the first increase would be 50 cents this September in 2024 at an additional 50 cents to our minimum wage as part of March 2025, and then 50 cents in September in 25, and then the 50, final 50 cents will be in 2026, taking us to the $15.11. So then moving forward after that, we then slightly reduce our compensation increases, but we continue to maintain where we're building and increasing our minimum wage. So we go to 50 cents a split over each in September and March again, but it'll be a 50 cent increase in 27, 28, and 29. And of course, this is all just uh, based on our assumptions and they are subject to change. So here's a reminder on the workforce compensation and benefits, the total number of investments that we've made over the past three years for our workforce. It's important to highlight all of these various programs because they do go into the overall benefits and compensation for our employees. So on the healthcare assumptions, we are in the process, we do have a solicitation out, we're on the process of um, taking our healthcare provider out, it's out to bid. So we're hoping a new contract will be in place, well, not hoping, a new contract will be in place January 2025. And so we are including an estimated increase as a result of the new solicitation. Um, and we're also looking at trying to hold healthcare costs for our employees. Uh, as well. So what we're covering in these next slides are really going to illustrate the FY 2024, our current employee and employer contribution. And so what you're seeing here is based on the basic plan compared to the consumer driven health plan, what those different premiums look like, how much the employee pays compared to how much the city pays. So here's the dollar version, and then we're gonna get into the percentage version. And this just shows you, based on the total, what portion the city is contributing to healthcare for our employees. And so we have it both for our civilians, and then you'll see for the police department, and then you'll also see for the El Paso Fire Department. And this just shows um, our commitment to public safety. Healthcare is an important component of our collective bargaining process. Um, they are putting their lives on the line, and this just shows the investment and con continued uh, commitment to our public safety departments. The last item you'll see is an additional cost driver, and so this just breaks down on average between the employees, uh, the healthcare cost, and this is civilian, compared to fire and police, and then on average also the pension cost per employee that the city is contributing. And so these are all major cost drivers because we continue to see prices go up as, as we are seeing at, at home, as you're seeing as consumers, we're also continuing to see that for healthcare and pension. So streets and facilities. As I highlight streets and facilities, we have, uh, we're going to continue to maintain our annual funding, which includes the $6 million for facility renovations, along with residential street resurfacing and collector streets resurfacing. For quality of life, uh, we're going to see that we're going to have a full year impact for the Mexican American Cultural Center, as well as La Nube and any additional uh, sports complex facility maintenance or flat fields that are coming online. We also are gonna continue our automated irrigation pilot project. And next I'll turn it over to Robert. Good morning, Mayor and City Council, Robert Cortinas. Good morning, sir. I'll try to maintain the 20 seconds per slide pace. 
So my portion of the presentation is going to focus on the debt service related to the capital project funding that we have. So not only existing, looking at our existing debt service, but also looking ahead over the next five years. Again, this is our five-year financial forecast. So looking at over the next five years, what those issuances are going to look like. I'll show you the debt model. And then we have some recommendations that we've been working on for the last several months. Again, no action today. This will be forthcoming at a future city council meeting, but to just show you all some of the things that we've been working on, again, to minimize the impact on the property tax rate, not only in this coming year, but over the next couple of years. So one of the things that we continue to work on is looking at, obviously, our existing debt service. And so in the upcoming budget year, we do have some increases related to issuances that were done in 2016 and 2021. That's going to increase our debt service amount by a little over $5.4 million between those two issuances. And then as we look ahead again in FY 2026, we do have a pretty substantial increase in the 2016 GOs. The city issued uh, about $300 million of debt. Uh, $200 million of that went for the general obligation bonds related to the 2012 uh, quality of life bond issuances. And so we have about a $6.9 million increase built in in our debt service in that year. And so, again, just focusing on existing, not even looking ahead to our future issuances, we already have built in increases on the existing debt service related to these three items in the next two years. And so what we have left remaining out of our general obligation bonds, so between the quality of life, public safety, community progress, we have approximately $601 million left to be issued. And so you can see what's been issued to date. The $558 million, 601 left to issue. The far right hand column there is the remaining cash on hand. And so with that, one of the things that we did obviously with the current year in FY24 was we did not do a debt issuance. We're utilizing again the bond proceeds that we have on hand, I'm pushing Sam to make sure we're spending those money down as quickly as possible, get those projects moving. Our fiscal year 2025, you'll see here the first row there again, due to the amount of bond proceeds that we have on hand, we're not recommending again, or won't be recommending to do a debt issuance in FY25. This will obviously help with the property tax rate. Um, but as we look ahead in FY26 and 27, you'll see pretty substantial uh, increases there. Almost 215 million in FY26, another 188 million in FY27. And so again, this is based on the timing of the projects. Again, myself, Margarita, the comptroller, Nicole Cody, working very closely with Sam, Yvette, and the capital improvement departments, looking at when these projects are going to need this funding to keep them on task and uh, keep them in line with the projected timelines. And so again, these are all projections and assumptions. Uh, you'll see what we're projecting again, as Nicole mentioned, the uh, projected valuation growth, and then what we're looking at as far as interest rates as well. Interest rates on the far right-hand column are very, very conservative. We're expecting much better interest rates. However, for modeling purposes, we like to be very conservative. And so you can see over the next several years, uh, we've got that $600 million planned out all the way through 2033. But really, as we're developing the budget for the coming year, we're really looking at what can we do today? What can we do now to not only help with the FY25 budget, but then obviously help with that FY26 and FY2027 budget to again minimize that impact we know we're going to see on the tax rate. So this model is showing, again, based on status quo, our existing debt service, taking into account also the future issuances that I just showed you over the next five years. And so you'll see in FY25, you'll see a, a slight increase. But when you look at FY26 and FY27, you'll see $11 million increase in 26, and then a $15 million increase in FY27. Again, that's taken into account uh, pretty substantial increases in the amounts that we're going to be issuing in FY26 and 27. And so what we've been working on is how can we uh, be proactive, again, to address those so that we don't have large spikes in the property tax rate in those future years. And so that was the, the dollar amount per year. This is the impact on the property tax rate on the debt service portion only. And so you'll see good news here. Um, FY25, you'll see the debt service rate going down by about a penny. And then you'll see that increase over FY26, 27, and then starting to flatten out in, once you get to FY28. And so again, the purpose of this portion of the presentation is really going to be some discussion on what we're working on now and what will be coming forward in, uh, probably in the May time frame for council action to again help with those future years to minimize the impact. And so I've talked about this again. We really take this as a multiple year approach. We know that we have um, quite a bit of debt remaining that's been already approved by the voters to issue over the next several years. And so what are we doing today to really minimize the impact on the future tax rate? So one of the things that we do have um, 
the ability to take advantage of is if we do refinancings. And so this is showing you our future callable debt, which means this is potential refinancing opportunities. Um, you'll see in FY24, we have a, a refinancing opportunity, which we are going to take advantage of. And as I mentioned, that'll be coming back in May. We have a little bit in FY25, and then you'll see in FY26, over $330 million of callable debt. So that's a great opportunity for us to do some refinancing to bring our debt service impact down to address that year. But you'll see in FY27, there's no refinancing opportunity, so no debt will be callable in that year. And so FY26, uh, again, great opportunity to do some refinancing, but really we need to plug that FY27 hole because we don't have a refinancing and we know we're gonna have a pretty large increase in the amount of debt we'll be issuing that year to fund those capital projects. So aside from the refinancing, another opportunity that we have and that we're going to recommend taking advantage of is utilizing our debt service reserves. And so I apologize, it's small, but this is in our annual comprehensive financial report, which is posted on the city website. This is for the debt service fund. You'll see at the bottom I circled in red. Currently we have about $15.5 million built up and reserves in our debt service fund. These funds are restricted to debt service, so we've levied property taxes to be used for debt service. They have to be used for debt service. And so one way that we can utilize them though is if um, we do a debt defeasance or we apply it to our existing debt. And so uh, what we've been working on, aside from the refinancing opportunity, which as I mentioned, will be coming uh, to the council in May for action to approve that action, and that will save approximately 5.1 million. Not all in one year, we have that savings spread out over multiple years, um, but that again will help not only in the FY25, but in the future year budgets as well. The second two items, I'm, I'm gonna go slowly here because these are very, very important items. So the second one there, a cash defeasance of bonds. So in FY27, again, if you remember, we have about a $15 million increase in our debt service payment that year. It's about a 2.1 cent increase on the property tax rate. And so not even looking at the operating side that Nicole just discussed, the future cost increases, just looking at the debt portion alone, right now we would have about a 2.1 cent increase, tax rate increase, as a result of the debt we need to issue. And so what we're recommending and what we're gonna be bringing back in May, as I mentioned, is to utilize some of that debt service reserves, about $6 million roughly, if you round up, $6 million of that, to essentially defeat the payment in FY27. And so what that would do is that bring that $15 million increase down to about a $9 million increase in FY27. It, I'll show you the impact on the tax rate, and so it really helps minimize and smooth out that future year tax rate. Again, as we're looking to the next several years and not just focus on FY25. The third item, again, similar to what we constantly do. I mean, we're always looking at different ideas, different opportunities to take advantage of. And so we're recommending or will be recommending to take a portion again of that debt service reserves, pay off the remaining amount for the Plaza Theater that we have. We still have a payment in this current year and then two more years on top of that. And so it's about $3.3 .3 million outstanding. And so we're recommending or will be recommending to take again a portion of our debt service reserves, pay that off early. Not only does it save a little bit of interest, but what that does is it frees up about $1.2 million, gives us flexibility as we move into future years to assign that to other items. And so, um, again, really being creative and you know, strategic about how we're utilizing the different tools, whether it's refinancing or debt service reserves, again, to minimize the impact in not only the coming year, but in future years as well. This is showing the amount of how we're covering the Plaza Theater uh, bond payment right now. And this is going back the last several years. You can see that currently the parking meter revenue, aside from the Saturday uh, meter revenue, is dedicated to go to the Plaza Theater. The, all the narrative, the text at the bottom is from the budget resolution. Uh, but in our last fiscal year, we generated about $861,000 million, or $861, from the parking meter revenue. It's not enough to cover our debt service payment for the Plaza Theater, so the general fund has been subsidizing that debt payment. Uh, this past year was about 356,000 that the general fund um, subsidized for that payment. Um, FY24, we're on about the same trajectory as far as what uh, amount will be needed to fund, again, that uh, debt payment in FY24. And so doing that action, paying that off early, it just, again, creates another source of revenue for us to be able to take advantage of, takes away that restriction that is currently in place on that parking meter revenue. So this shows you uh, the comparison to doing the refinancing and the defeasance is the blue line, and then doing the refinancing and the defeasance is the red line. And you'll see really, again, how do we plug that FY27 
large increases were really one of the things that we've been working on. We have, again, refunding opportunities in FY26, so we are expecting to bring that impact down. But in FY27, as I mentioned, it'll bring that overall uh, increase from about $15 million down to about a little over $9 million increase. On the tax rate, and so this is what it does to the overall tax rate. So instead of a 2.1 cent increase in FY27, it brings it down to about a penny. And again, being very conservative in modeling, remembering we're very conservative on the uh, interest rates being used, very conservative on property valuation growth. But again, the thing that we constantly work on is how do we smooth out that increase over time and not have large spikes in the debt service rate alone when we know that we're going to have challenges over on the operating general fund side. So again, these numbers are all assumptions, uh, projections. We will be coming back in May timeframe to request council action on the refinancing and on the defeasance for the FY27 and for the positive theater debt payment to pay that off early. And so that will be forthcoming, um, as I mentioned, in May. And so with that, I will kick it back over to Ms. Cody. So FY25, um, 2025, you'll see there's the $7.1 million estimated uh, gap that we're looking at. And so as we continue to look ahead into FY 2025, of course, uh, we will always look at new general fund revenue possibilities, cost savings, and any other financial tools that'll help us minimize that impact on our property taxes. We continue to see uh, the investment in public safety, our workforce, as well as our streets, aging facilities, and equipment as we continue to build the budget. So civilian pay increases, of course, we need to be very cognizant of the health care, rising health care costs, as well as ensuring that we're reaching that $15 by 2026. Again, we're going to have, we're estimating three academies and two for the El Paso Fire Department, but we need to also focus that we do have other items, other expenditures that are on the horizon, which include, of course, the citywide election this November, uh, the continued uh, climate action plan development efforts, the requested equity office, our municipal ID uh, program, as well as the department program requests, and then the, with the rising costs, the cost for residential resurfacing. So in summary, we still have five months remaining until the 2025 budget is adopted. The departments have officially kicked off their budget process and we do open everything, we will be opening everything today uh, for them to enter their budgets. We'll be working with the departments and of course our interim city manager as we continue to develop the FY 2025 budget. So the next part we would like to kick off is our chime in. So chime in officially will be kicked off um, tomorrow. We've got it for March 26. Uh, the last day will be March 31st for chime in. I mean March, May 31st, I apologize. And then we will begin, of course, our council briefings are going to be one-on-one, -on -one, and then we'll go into the goal team presentations. We've got additional dates at the end of this presentation as well. And then um, you, have, you also see uh, the received uh, certified property tax valuations. Of course, we'll receive them on the 25th. Uh, we're looking at special council meetings coming up and then as well as the possible adoption on August 13th. So first on the chime in side, we have, uh, as the launch will be tomorrow, we will be including, uh, of course, uh, social media, three, it'll be on 311 app, we'll continue with digital signage, we're going to do um, advertising through social media as well. Uh, we're looking at incentives to get people to be able to respond. Uh, you'll see there's been a slight decline each year after 2022 in our chime in response, but we're going to work really hard to ensure that we keep the numbers at the same. If not, we inc increase them back to our 2022 levels. In addition, we have the council budget requests. And so the council budget request will be submitting an email to you all, will receive, and it'll include the link, and it's on a seamless doc form that you'll be able to fill out. This is the link here. Um, you'll simply click on it uh, for El Paso employees, and you'll be able to submit your council budget request 
as well. Here's the forms. Uh, the form, we have not changed the form for this year. Uh, you're able to go ahead and upload any additional uh, detail that you would like to include. We do encourage that you put uh, a good description. Remember, all of this will be provided to you as part of the budget process, and we do go through each item uh, as, as part of the budget process itself. So here again, this is the overall timeline, and then here are the final uh, budget calendar dates. So June 3rd through the 14th is those two weeks we'll be scheduling with you all uh, the mayor and city council briefings. Uh, we are projecting for July 8th through the 12th is going to be the budget overview and goal team presentation. So that's when we'll be having our budget workshops with city council. We're looking at July 30th for the introduction of the tax rate ordinance and then of course the budget hearing and we're looking at August 13th for the adoption of the budget but we do have the 20th available if we need it. And that concludes the presentation. Thank you all for your time. Thank you very much for both of you for the presentation. Uh, very informative. Um, Representative Hernandez followed by Representative Canales. Thank you. Um, Nicole, I wanted to ask you uh, about health care and the, where, where we're at on that process. I, I looked at the online bidding and I only see the consultant. Is there a separate um, RFP you're doing for the future of health care? So the health care, it's it's it should be on the Ion Wave. It's, our, it's the health care provider. Okay, I, well, you'll have to direct me at it another time because I only saw the consent. How far are we along in that process with choosing our next vendor? I think we're in the evaluation phase. Evaluation? Okay. Um, I really wish I would have known. Uh, th this is a health care is always the number one conversation uh, during budget seasons. And when, when we're re looking at some of these contracts, you know, I think that we should have a discussion about what the scope of work is. Because, in my opinion, this may be a missed opportunity. So my hope is we can um, either request an addendum for additional costs for additional services, and um, that way we can determine whether or not we want to include it in the overall package. And so oh. what I'm referring to is um, uh, the, I'm getting inquiries from residents, um, excuse me, not residents, city employees and uh, family members of their youth about if, whether or not our insurance can provide gender affirming care. Is there a prohibition? Are we are do are there any government programs that we can look at? And as a reminder for anybody who's concerned about getting into this into this world, um, I want to read a statement from the Department of U.S. Health and Human Services in response to Governor Abbott and the state legislature and their attack and their continuous attacks on trans youth in its states. The Texas government's attacks against transgender youth and those who love and care for them are discriminatory and unconscionable. These actions are clearly dangerous to the health of transgender youth in Texas at HHS. We listen to medical experts and doctors and they agree with us that access to affirming care for transgender youth is essential and can be life-saving. HHS is committed to protecting young Americans who are targeted because of their sexual orientation or gender identity and supporting their parents, caretakers, and families. That is why I directed my team to evaluate the tools at our disposal to protect trans and gender diverse youth in Texas. And today I'm announcing several steps we can take to, to protect them. And this was um, last year after Texas implemented this ban. Now, because of what's happening in Austin, families in El Paso, are at, and including city employees, are asking how they can get that gender affirming care. So that's a conversation that I'd like to understand as we progress in this upcoming budget cycle. And I'd like to, I'd like to have a meeting about how we can at least try to determine for our, from our current provider if they provide that service. Yes, ma'am, I'll pass that on to Ms. Wiggins and make sure that she gets with you yeah. on that item. You mentioned 8%. How are we getting that forecasted 8%. So it's just based increase. on what we're seeing locally and what we looking what we're also looking at in Texas as far as rising health care costs. So it's just our normal cost uh, associated with refreshing the contract as well. Do we have an, uh, an assessment or idea what the potential increase can be uh, based on the evaluations? No ma'am. No? Okay. No, it's still under the cone of silence. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. That definitely would like to have uh, additional conversations about that. Yes. Um, we had. Uh, I want to talk about your debt service model um, 
uh, formulas that you're looking at. From what I recall, looking at um, El Paso Waters, um, they, they did uh, several bonds recently, and they were coming back about 4%. 6.5% under the current conditions and looking at the markets as they're cooling off, I think is incredibly high. And I think we owe honesty to the, to the voters and El Pasoans. And I know that you have to be conservative because it's so volatile, but if we're gonna be making decisions based on the future of these quality of life projects, and we have to have an honest conversation about how the numbers that you present today aren't necessarily the numbers that we see in real life, because not only does it fluctuate, but does your formula include the potential revenues from our commercial tax bait as a result of the implementation and the build of these new projects? Specifically, the multi-purpose center, the, the Mexican American Culture Center, the Children's Museum, the excess sales tax revenues that we can anticipate, including hotel taxes, because that is what's continuously missing from the budget conversation I have asked, that we include the economic impact, the potential increase of revenues side by side through our debt service model, and we have not in the past seven years done that. So let me take your first comment. So as far as interest rates, we can make that number be whatever we want it to be. The intent of that is to, it's exactly that, it's a model. It's to give you an idea, based on those assumptions, what the future impact is going to look like. Sure, we can be more aggressive and say 4%, 5%. However, the intent is really just to provide the council an idea what those future years are going to look like. Obviously, as we get closer to the time frame, we will show you what we're looking at. So in May, for example, when we come back, we'll show you what we're projecting, even though we won't be priced until June or July, what those interest rates are going to look like, because we're in the current environment. We're in a national, we have a national election coming up in November. I can't tell you what interest rate's going to be next year. I don't think you could tell me what interest rate's going to be next year. The intent is just to be a model, to provide the council information, on what these future years are going to look like based on the information that's on the slide and those assumptions. On the second comment about future impact on different revenues, I mean, you see what we're projecting as far as property valuation growth. Um, again, FY25, the coming uh, fiscal year, we're looking at about a 7.5%. We just got pre-preliminary reports from the Central Appraisal District, which aren't even updated yet. We won't actually get preliminary information until later in April, um, towards the end of April. And so at that point in time, they're going to provide us an some idea on what the 20% uh, cap on commercial properties is going to look like. And obviously, we'll make adjustments as we go. Looking beyond FY25, what we're looking at as far as future taxable evaluation growth, it's really, and I'll go back to the slide. FY2 will bring that presentation up. And so when you look at this slide, you'll see when we had the BRAC growth starting at the far left-hand side there in FY 2004, and you'll see the city went through a pretty sizable growth as far as increase in property values, all the way through 2009, and then you see it drop off. So from 2010 all the way through about 2018, essentially property valuations was flat. The average value home did not increase at all during that almost decade time period. Prior to COVID, we started to see around 4% increase in um, property valuation growth. Obviously, COVID hit, and we saw a little bit of a downtick, but we were averaging right around 4%, which was more than almost double than what we had seen during that prior 10-year time span. You'll see what we were projecting in future years in those outer years is we're projected to come back down to be more in line with what we saw prior to COVID. Again, these are all assumptions. These are things that are obviously going to change, whether it's an economic development driver that has more of an impact than we estimated. These are all just assumptions based on the information that we have, again, utilizing historical data, and these will change. Again, these are modeling purposes only. This is just to provide the council some context and some ideas behind the things that we're facing, the things that we know about, and things that we can do today to begin to address these things and have these types of discussions. Yeah, sure, I just, I just wanna completely reiterate over and over again that historically we've never invested in ourselves. Now we are, now we have. And the, those um, projects have not come to fruition yet because of you know whatever legal battles or just the time it's taken to build these signature projects. We will see a dramatic increase in our sales tax revenues. And that has been seen in our economic impact analysis from back when, when we were actually studying how our downtown redevelopment would attribute to our tax base. 
we don't have that in our current formulas. Is that correct? We don't have. We don't, we're not no forecasting formula. the potential for the increased revenues to our general fund as a result of these economic development signature projects in downtown. Do we currently have that forecasted in our formula? It's based on utilizing historical data. Okay. So looking no, at taxes, right? Looking at property taxes yes. and, and historical sales tax revenues. But when you look at sales tax, I mean, sales tax is generally pretty stable. We don't see, other than the last few years, we don't see significant increases or decreases in our sales tax, even during, this is a pretty good graph here because you can see sort of slow and steady is what sales tax does. Even during the Great Recession, we saw a little bit of a, a downtick. Obviously during COVID, a little bit of a downtick, but then it bounced back right away. And so that's the orange line, the six month smoothing, really highlights that and reiterates that. But when you look at the blue line, Sales tax is slow and steady, continues to grow, continues to grow, three to five percent every year, three to five percent every year. It's not, uh, I mean, based on 25 years of data, it's not, there's nothing in the data that shows we're going to continue to see 15 to 20 percent increase and, in sales And that's tax. because historically we've never invested in ourselves, and that's the point I'm trying to make, is that the variance here and where you're seeing that difference in increases is the minute that we had downtown redevelopment when the ballpark went in place when they started to spend more money as a result of now having a quality of life amenity i just don't want the conversation to be lost that we have not forecasted the potential revenues and the economic drivers as a result of our downtown redevelopment because it's not showing here because it is clear in the empirical data that's been presented to us over the past 10 years that we will see an uptick. It's not being included in that. But what you are showing is what the impact will be with the status quo, without additional revenues, that will come from that downtown redevelopment. And I want to make sure that that's clear, that I'm understanding that correctly. Right, that's yes. correct. Okay, thank you. Um, moving on to the uh, slide related to the potential economic drivers. And I know I'm running out of time, so I want to just make this cl clear, quick. Municipal ID, we funded that. Why is that on the table? and the administrative costs are supposed to cover additional um, enhanced library cards. Equity office, you and I have had multiple conversations and we went to lanes to make sure that that was funded through savings. Why is this now being placed into, on the, on, on, as, a, as a driver for the next fiscal year? There's only one position funded right now. There's, I've never made a comment about additional savings funding that office. W where's the money coming from? We funded it? We have one position that's currently funded. Current funding. That, isn't that what we're looking for? What are you envisioning on what the cost would be for an equity office? We don't have that yet, and so that'll okay. come, come forward. We still have the cross-functional team. We've, obviously, we've recently had a, a turnover with the leader of that cross-functional team. Uh, we have a new person assigned to take over what was going on, uh, continue to do the outreach with the groups. Um, that'll be coming forward as part of the budget process of what that office is going to look like. Um, I, I, and I don't think that any of the, I think just for context, everything that's been shown on that slide doesn't mean that that's up for discussion. These are council <coughs> decisions in terms of what's been funded. And I think it was just important just to reflect in, a, in, in addition to the other requirements, these are things that, that um, this body has agreed to fund going forward. It's going to be a driver. And look, the purpose in all this is just to show you the, the different things that um, we as a city are going to have to take into account relative to the budget, but not, not that it's up for a, you know, for a, for a decision to take something off that's already been decided to do. No, and I, and I understand. Um, I want to make, because those two items were highlighted, so that's why I'm highlighting those two items that we've had a discussion about funding them. I was just curious why they're back up. If we didn't, if we didn't hire an equity officer this year, roll over the money to next year. Um, because there may be additional positions. I mean, I don't know what that looks like. It's just something that the council's taking action on. It's something that we just want to make sure, keep in front of mind, that there may be additional positions right. potentially related to that. Yeah, it, it needs That's, a home first. We need to find where the home goes so that we can determine whether or not there's going to be supplemental costs as a result of the need. And uh, going back to healthcare real quick, I just wanted to make sure to re reiterate it, the request for women's issues. Um, yes. from the Women's Rights Commission and looking at either short-term uh, policies, short, uh, all of those disability policies to make sure we can reach that. Yeah. So, so we've you. already done some work on that. That'll be coming back pretty soon. Thank you. This is budget season, folks, so this is the work we have to put in. Thank you. Um, you know, she did bring up something in mind that kind of sparked a thought in my mind here while she was saying some things. Now, this year, because we did do some 
every f so many years, five years, I think it is, we have to spend an update and spend on the ballpark. This year we spent four or five million dollars. How much did we spend to re, um, I know that. Uh, oh, on the five years TIP for the ballpark? Right. And then every so many years we have to do that. Have, did we accrue that? Because as the stadium gets older, I think the expense will be higher. And are we taking that into consideration? Mr. Mayor Sam Rodriguez, um, the CIP that was approved was just over six million. It was like 6.2, 6.3 million over the next five years. So every year we bring a, a CIP to council for the ballpark that will encompass the total the next expense five was years. what though? Like four or five million? I'm sorry. That what you brought to us was what was the total expense you brought to us? It was a total of um, just over 6.2 million, but okay, it's over a five-year okay. period. It's on average a 1.3 million dollar sure. expenditure. Right. I, I just want to make sure, and as it gets older. It, uh, I think that number will continue to increase, and we got to make sure we take that into consideration when we're looking at that. So, yes, thank you for that. It just sparked my mind when we're talking about investment in the downtown and all. Right, and that's why we continue to look at those different revenue sources to try to, to free them up as much as possible, like the Plaza Theater. Currently, that parking meter revenue that'll give us some flexibility in the future. Absolutely, thank you for that. Uh, Representative Canales. Thanks, Mayor. Um, I wanted to start off saying. Uh, I appreciate the projected compensation assumptions all the way out to 29. Um, you know, I know uh, in my resolution I asked for the the $15 mark to be hit by by 26, but I think it's important that we continue to project out those increases, and that we do it incrementally like this. Right. Um, you know, it's, uh, better to have that built in and and understand what we'll need for compensation instead of. The, the kind of falling behind and then bigger jumps that we've we've had to do so um, I really appreciate seeing that uh, built in here um, I also had a similar question about health care um, and the and gender affirming care I know um, this uh, is something that that I guess was was brought to my attention uh, a few months ago um, and am, am I correct in saying, I don't know if it's a question for Ms. Wiggins or somebody else, am I correct in saying we are already exploring the option of the addition of gender affirming care in the new uh, procurement as part of the scope? So as Ms. Cody mentioned, we're in the cone of silence, so I don't want to talk about the future contract, but what we can sure. do as part of the recommendation from the Women's Commission that we're working on, we need to come back to council, we can include some discussion on that so we can talk about the current contract. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. I, and, and I know the state of affairs with the current contract. Um, apparently, this going way back to when we first started with the current provider. Uh, I learned the city opted out of that coverage. Um, again, we're talking more than a decade ago. Uh, you know, I, I know you can't talk about a future contract. It, we'll it include is a that priority as of mine as well. Yeah, to we'll include, we'll include that. that in the presentation when we come back on the Women's Commission. Recommendations. Excellent. Okay. And then I had a question about chime in. Um, are we going to be able to separate out this year, uh, or I guess sort the uh, chime in responses by district? I know that's been something that I've been asking Ms. Cody about for a long time. We can try it. For the most part, from what we've seen, people don't know the district that they live in. They know north, south, east, northeast. I mean, they don't necessarily relate to a district. Right. We can do it and see what kind of response we get. I mean, you may get skewed because people don't know what district especially with redistricting not that long ago but yeah, if we can capture address I don't know that everybody wants to share address we can do that as, on, as an optional field or something but if we can capture address then we can maybe do that on the back end um, and then the other option is potentially an embeddable the the district locator if we can embed that on the on the page at least for the people taking it online um, you know I know we do some paper survey uh, but for the people online, they can look it up themselves and then input without having to share their address. I don't know if that's, I, I know it launches tomorrow, so I'm, I'm getting to you at the last minute here, but we, ha we have had conversations with Co Ms. Cody and I'd love to be able to capture specifically district by district what people are asking for. Yes, yeah, sir, I think the way we currently have it designed is we'll just, we're just asking for them to drop in their district, but we can see if we can drop in that link as well. As you know, we want it to be a short survey so that we get a, a large number of responses. But we're also adding, um, and this is in response to, to your, to your comments during the strategic planning session, we're adding back those focus groups 
Excellent. in person so that way we can drill down into the individual topics and we'll have more information to be able to provide counsel. Excellent. Yeah, and again, I think it's a good opportunity for people to learn what district they're in. Unfortunately, I think there are a lot of people who uh, aren't aware. It's not necessarily their fault. They're busy living their lives. They don't they don't know what district they're in and, you know, until they need to vote. Um, so it's a good opportunity to get it in front of them in another place. Uh, that's all. Thank you, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, Dr. Acevedo. Oh, I, I guess one, one thing that as we're going into this, we just did our strategic plan and I was looking at slide nine. So are we going to integrate that into this um, budget session or budget cycle, I guess? Not Absolutely. So yeah. the recently adopted strategic plan, there will be, yes, incorporation of those different items. Um, council, as Nicole mentioned, will have the opportunity as part of the council budget request, and we'll make sure we walk that through with you. Council will have the opportunity to introduce or uh, provide some of that input as far as what they want to see in the budget, addressing some of those items, but absolutely. Yeah, and I, I understand that this is a very high-level um, presentation. It has like 100 slides either way. <laughs> But I, I guess um, more detail on this would, would be a lot helpful for me, and that, that would be nice. Um, I'm sure we're going to get budget books and stuff like that. And then um, when we're going into the meetings, just having more um, that one-on-one -on -one time, because I'm, I'm also trying to understand a breakdown of what exactly has happened in District 2 for the past years, especially with what the past city manager did specifically to District 2. Um, so that's going to be something that's top of mind as I'm going into the budget session um, and kind of want to throw that out there sure. now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we'll start scheduling some time with you to go through the current budget book. I think that'll be a good refresher and then we won't have the FY25 book until probably late and, May, third week of May is probably when that book would be and it'll be everything and more that you can ever imagine as far as budget reports. And specifically, I I mean, I understand historical budget books will probably be good to, to have in that sense, and I, I have them in my office already, but more more than anything, I want to understand what he stopped um, and if we could get a financial number on what he stopped. Like, you know, he he closes the Granby Pool, for example, the Nation Sylvan Pool, and really um, getting a top-of-line number on the things that were stopped in terms of what happened quality of life wise there I think sure. that's going to be really important for me and then um, just a, a simple thing on you know healthcare is always a, a thing that um, I think local government entities just can't tackle because there's so many employees and it's 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 a difficult thing and so I'm happy to see this um, new RFP but one thing that I wanted to ask is on the slide 59 we have a breakdown by cost on um, employee versus employer, and then we have the percentages, but we didn't get the cost for police and fire. So if we could get that, that would be helpful, not just the percentages. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Um, Let me, the, uh, Representative Hernandez. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Um, at our last uh, community meeting, I did get a request, and I just want to bring those to the forefront. The Neighborhood Traffic Management Program, there's a waiting list there. I think last year we were able to clear the 22 on the list. I'd like to see where we're at with those, the current pending ones. Okay. Uh, again, for Street Light Fund, we usually put 150000 um, And then sidewalk gaps, uh, don't understand the proposal, but if there's not a proposal, we, if we can include those for persons with disabilities. Um, and then finally, um, capital plans so historically every year Mr. Rodriguez would come to council and show us the 2019 2020 capital plan or whatever it be and then we'd have a discussion about which capital plans um, are necessary to be made to the list and if we can set aside MPO matching dollars and then set aside um, dollars for some of these capital plans some of them require matching grants um, and uh, want to make sure that we are considering putting aside dollars for matching grants, if we can at least hold them as a placeholder, like a fund, a restricted fund to hold it as a placeholder, so we can draw down as we are awarded, because this is 
really a historic time where we're not we're, we're getting all this money and then we're having to find the matching dollars that's um, absolutely going to be part of the discussion with this budget development process is those matching funds required for not only the MPO but just the discretionary grant program as well ensuring that we have access to those as we need them great perfect and then again capital plan I am getting requests not only from my district but from the rest of the city related to traffic calming measures that don't qualify under NTP other things for the capital plan would like to have the conversation if council doesn't want to fund it at least let's have a conversation on which projects future councils can consider um, so that we can get the work done for our constituents thanks thank you ma'am mayor pro tem yeah i just got a two quick questions um have we ever tried to estimate the stagnant or decreased population as people flee outside the city limits due to high taxes have you ever tried to figure out the impact of that no, not to that detail, but obviously with the reports we get from Academy, we're obviously looking at number of homesteads, which we've seen right. go down a little bit. We have a number of commercial properties, and so we're using all of that information from those reports okay. to try to project out what the impact is going to be on the future taxable valuation growth. Okay. Have we ever tried to allocate, decide whether uh, any individual tax driver was an, an instigator of new purchases or merely a reallocation of existing available funds of the families? No, not unless it has an economic development incentive agreement tied to it. And then in that case, we'd be able to know directly. Or for example, the ballpark, we know how much sales tax the ballpark generates, mm -hmm. but typically we don't have. Is that why you use the back row numbers to do your estimations? Absolutely. Again, this is a, a five year forecast. We know these numbers are going to change. We know historically. What, what's going to happen with property valuations? We know what's going to happen with sales tax. We can project out pretty accurately what the future revenues are going to look like. Okay. Even with the new project that may come into the town. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, both Thank of you. you. I know it took a lot of time and preparation for, you know, to bring us a hundred slides. So uh, no, I thank you for for doing that, and did a really good job. Thank you, sir. Item number four is presentation and update by Success Through Technology Education Foundation on the organization's FY 2023 annual report, including a status update on activities, use of grant funds, and progress toward performance measures identified by the American Rescue Plan Act agreement between the city of El Paso and the foundation. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Daniel Hansen, Economic and International Development. Item four is the success through Technology Education Foundation delivering their annual report to council as required by the ARPA subrecipient agreement executed April of 2023. The STTE Foundation is a local nonprofit whose mission is to support efforts that develop, deploy, and advance educational programs focused in science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics. Uh, with the ARPA funding, STTE will offer a four-year program that will assist 20 local startups. To date, they have received 133,000 of the $500,000 uh, grant agreement. Delivering the annual report is Stephanie Schilling, the Ventures Manager at STTE. Uh, good morning, good Mayor morning. and Council. Hi, uh, thank you so much for allowing us to be here today and share some of the success that we've had over the last year with the STT Ventures Program. The Ventures Program was really um, intended to bolster the startup ecosystem in the borderland and we've seen um, really great success during year one. Um, during year one in the spring, we did a recruitment process. We had uh, 18 startups apply to participate in the program. Um, they went through a screening process and five were selected. Those five were selected based on their compatibility to meet the metrics of this grant agreement, which was to increase revenue, increase users, increase customer segments, um, and increase the number of uh, team members of their startup. Um, and so throughout the year, um, what they did I'm sorry. Okay, there we go. So the Startups Ventures program, once they're admitted, they work through the ideation process. They look at market fit. Um, we work with them in creating their business model canvas. Um, they do participate in a six-week sprint accelerator program with the New Mexico State University. Um, they then um, are each given $5,000 of in-kind resources that they can use on either legal, marketing, or development services. 
They then participate at an end of season uh, pitch competition, which last year was the Dia de los Muertos pitch competition. And so those five startups um, competed and were ranked and then received prizes based on their placement in the pitch competition. Um, today we have four of the five startup founders here to um, speak a little bit about what their startup is and, and how the program, um, what the outcomes of, of their participation in the program is. Hello, good morning, Council. This is cool. I've never done this before. Um, so that's me right there on that picture. I'm pitching to Brad Smith, the president of Microsoft. Um, he was actually very impressed with what we did, so much so he gave us $300,000 $300, worth of uh, Azure credits, uh, which basically means our infrastructure is covered for like two years. Um, so I'm Marco. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Eisenflow, where we're building a small language model for logistics. That means is we're automating the manual tasks that people in freight don't want to do uh, so they can focus on the stuff they really care about. Because right now the problem they have is that 50% of their workload is just on repetitive tasks, which means they're losing 30% of the revenue every single year. And we're trying to combat that with our software. Um, the way this program helped us was it put us on the map. So there's some venture capital here in El Paso. Uh, there's prominent uh, families here in the city that will actually fund startups, but they need to know that they exist. So we've already raised 250 last year because of the program, and we're looking to raise another million this year so we can expand uh, and grow further. And um, another thing we do is, since we're hiring locally, uh, we're actually making an impact in the city. So we don't, you know, we don't start off paying people 725 an hour. It's like 15 plus. Um, and we're looking for engineering. We have four people from UTEP. I graduated from UTEP. So we're actually giving back to the community through this program. So it's super helpful. Thank you. Good morning, Council. Thank you. Uh, my name is Roland Rios. I'm the CEO and founder of uh, Cider Water Treatment. Um, this is a company that used to be just a brick and mortar, you know, like water treatment, filtration. Um, devices and uh, going through the program allowed me to now become a technology company that's developing uh, the first IoT uh, water soften and reverse osmosis for residential purposes. Uh, we're focusing in residential because there's more users than uh, at the utility or uh, commercial level. And um, the goal is to become the first, uh, again, IoT or smart as well, as more well known in the community. Uh, to deliver uh, high quality water and uh, allowing us as residents to be able to take uh, the extra steps that um, with the water when it comes down to water um, not not only relying on the utility um, this has allowed us to um, bring in uh, venture capital investment into our company the, going through this program and also again uh, further in developing into technology thank you Good morning, Mayor and Council. My name is Jack Cleveridge, and I'm the co-founder and uh, CEO of Panoculum, and I'm also the co-president of Stanford Angels and Entrepreneurs of Texas. And what we're doing is building a virtual platform for um, capturing and storing memories, interpreting them. Um, we are working on both the computer vision and the natural language processing side of that platform to create a memory engine um, for uh, contextualizing and performing sentiment analysis on stories about the past. So that's a photo of me with my mom um, when I was one year old. And what we're trying to do is capture the memories of baby boomers in particular. Uh, they're a large aging demographic and connecting them with millennials like myself. Um, through the Ventures program, we were able to identify great talent here in El Paso to serve as our design team and our engineering team. Um, and we're continuing to build that out through uh, marketing outreach and determining product ma market fit. So we really appreciate the investment that you've made in STTE and um, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. Hello, my name is Hunt Burdick. I am CTO of uh, Squad Pilot. And <clears throat> what we do is we take mission, vision, core values of organizations and oper operationalize them uh, through our business operating system. Uh, we are taking a legacy process that is typically facilitated by one-off consultants and maxi maximizing and facilitating it through AI. 
Uh, STTE has been instrumental uh, through our formative uh, stage. One of the things they've helped me do is actually find a co-founder that is much better at public speaking than me. This is not my strong point. Um, he is not able to be here today, so I'm standing in uh, in his place. But uh, very excited to be part of the program and uh, what it's done for us. So thank you. Thank you. And I'll add to Squad Pilot. I think they just secured their first large enterprise customer. Um, so we're real excited for them and, and their progress. Um, the fifth startup that participated in the Ventures program was Veritech Medical, and they, um, their goal was um, to use technology as an early oral disease detecting device. Um, and so Veritech is, is now out of town. They've left El Paso, um, but they did start through the Ventures program. As we look um, to year two of the Ventures program, we're currently in the recruitment process, and so the Ventures application is open through April 15th. Um, we have modified the application from last year to kind of align a little closer with these metrics that we're measuring through the grant. Um, and so we're seeing a lot more inquiries about what startups, what does it mean to be a startup, who should start a startup, um, and kind of how to navigate that. And so we're really excited that there's a little bit more of an education piece coming to the community and we're looking to see the Ventures program uh, grow. This is the overall uh, economic impact of the program from last year. Um, as I'm going to go back to this last slide. We had um, targets of five new customer segments. We ended up with 12 new customer segments, an increase in users from 10 to 68. And again, these measurements were taken just through the end of the program, which was in October of 2023. But from October to now, we've seen uh, startups like Eyes and Flow that have grown their user number significantly. Um, the increase in revenue, the goal was 10,000, and we did 150,000. Um, the access to capital, I think, is where we're really seeing uh, a lot of value in this program um, for this upcoming year for 2024 um, we do have a um, major investor who's gone public with an IPO has sold it um, and it really has his name on the map and is really tar um, has a goal to increase um, entrepreneurship in the borderland and so we're excited to continue to grow this network to help ventures along the program throughout the years and I think that was it for us thank you so much for having us Thank you, and thank you all, and congratulations on everything. Ms. Mayor, Pern? I did request to speak. I'm sorry. Yes, go ahead, Representative. Um, I just wanted to say to uh, th this is the first time I've seen one of your presentations, and really well job done. Th this is a, a really major um, advancement in the tech world, and so heard a lot of your ideas. Uh, th they're really inspiring, and really proud that they're coming out of El Paso. And yes, you are a great public speaker. Own it. <laughs> thank you all for being here. Congratulations. Thank you, and uh, again, uh, thank you for sharing these success stories with us, and we look forward to seeing you all next year with some more success stories. With that, Ms. Prime. Yes, sir. Item number five is a presentation and update from the El Paso Electric Company on its advanced metering system deployment plan, AMS surcharge, and non-standard metering service fees. All right. Uh, good morning, Mayor and Council. Ian Volgoid, uh, Strategic and Legislative Affairs Director. Good morning, sir. Um, in 2022, uh, the city settled uh, the AMS, the Advanced Metering uh, System rollout with El Paso Electric. As part of that agreement, uh, they come every year to do a presentation on their uh, customer education report. So with that, I'd like to hand it over to Daniel Perez with El Paso Electric. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Mayor Council. Um, thank you for having us today. Really appreciate the time. Um, Daniel Perez, El Paso Electric. Um, really excited to be here. Um, we are doing a monumental change out of, of our entire metering system, right? And so we are, we are um, proud to be here and, and walk you through kind of the status of it and how our customer education plan is, is, is rolling out. So with that, I'll turn it over to Tugdi Sajar Ramirez to go through the, the technical components first. Good morning. Good morning, ma'am. Mayor, members of council, my name is Grisel Ramirez. I'm the supervisor of the Smart uh, Advanced Metering and Analytics Department at El Paso Electric. And um, we can move to the next slide, please. Um, the implementation of Smart Metering technology in our service territory has um, 
provide us provide our customers the opportunity to have to visualize their consumption data and with that information to have better understanding of, of their energy use uh, to make better decisions and find opportunities of how can reduce their bill and save energy. So uh, these also, these smart meters provide immediate notifications to our systems when customers are experiencing an outage. And with that, we can send our crews directly to these uh, the location of failures and the power can be restored much faster. Um, in essence, having the access to consumption data can allow us to provide better recommendations to our customers, advance alerts, have a more reliable grid, and ultimately a better customer service experience. Um, this project started back in 2022 with installations of our back office systems and the communications network throughout our service territory. In April, we, st we installed the first smart meter in El Paso, and as of today, we have 200,000 smart meters in our ser service territory, out of uh, which 150,000 are installed in El Paso. This is um, our smart meter deployment schedule. We divided our service territory into six areas. Uh, as you can see, we currently are deploying meters in area one, two, and six. Areas one through five are located in Texas. And right here, I we show you the areas including the zip codes and also the total number of meters. Uh, we are currently are preparing to begin our fourth area, which is gonna be area three. And this map shows a correlation of the smart meters installed per district. As you can see, the black areas, the darker areas, are where the most um, uh, installations of meter have taken place. So you can see District 2, 8, 1, and 4. And I'll hand it over to my colleague, George De La Torre, to go over the customer education report. Good morning, Mayor Council. My name is George De La Torre. I'm the Director of Corporate Communications at El Paso Electrics. Thank you I for having me. I just want to let you know there's no one else for you to pass it off to, so you're it. <laughs> Daniel. Go, ahead. go sit down, Daniel. Okay. <laughs> no, thank you so much. I just want to go over some of the highlights from the report that we filed regarding our 2023 customer education plan that we had rolled out. So in 2022, we met with Black & Beach, who is the consultant of ours, who's done several of these installations and customer education plans throughout the nation. And we've also partnered with Han Communications, who's helping us roll out the communication plan that you've been seeing, hopefully throughout the entire service area that we have. So some of our goals that we really wanted to reach was to demonstrate transparency and responsibility throughout the project, really educate our employees, our customers, your constituents about the benefits of smart meters and then make sure that we continue to inform customers as we go through the entire process since it's a very, it's a multi-year process. So we rolled out the customer education plan into three different phases. So the first phase was awareness. We wanted to make sure that everyone knew that we were gonna be replacing their current meters in their homes, in their commercial properties, and throughout our service area. And then phase two is more about the installation process and we came up with a really, we think, creative idea of how to do that with the installers, and you'll see that in a little bit. Our, in 2025, we'll start our phase three, which is the post-deployment plan, which really talks about how, what programs we're gonna be filing for that you'll hear about later in this year um, once all the installations are complete in 2025. These are some of the few key metrics that we wanted to share with you. So we look at impressions where we are basically having all of our education campaign throughout our service territory. And you can see that we do social media, broadcast, print, digital on several different websites, all throughout our service area. So we're always focusing on different, our, oper our optimization areas. So you'll see here that we had about 39 million impressions in 2023, and impressions represent the number of times an ad was served on any media platform. So these are the key numbers for 2023. So for phase one, just for a quick breakdown bullet point is where we started with the awareness. So the smart meter, we created a smart meter microsite website and explainer videos on what the installation process is gonna look like and just what a smart meter is. Um, we created a 
very robust FAQs page for our customers and for our employees as well. We have a pocket flyer that we wanted to bring with you all today to show you kind of what we've been handing out in the community, but we just attended two different weekend events this last weekend, one at Encanotillo Health Fair, and yesterday, I mean, on Saturday with the Expo Familia at the Solano, and ran out of all the pocket flyers that we had. So we've been doing a lot of community outreach. Um, we have did bill inserts. We have an e-newsletter that we send out to all of our customers with an extremely high open rate that we're really, really proud of every single month. So that's always included in our newsletter. Uh, we've attended several community meetings, several of yours as well, and then just being out in the events, different community events overall. Um, we continue to con continue to serve email communications. We have employee internet page for our employees, and then we're always working with media to make sure that our stories are being told and just educating again our, our customers on what's going on with this with this program. And again, social media is very key in our area, Facebook is specifically. Um, on phase two, we created an interactive map on our website, so you actually go onto the website, enter in your zip code, and it'll tell you around when we're going to be in your area to install the meter. Um, we did direct mail postcards so that they know that within 30 to 60 days, we will be at your home commercial property to change out the meter. We have door hangers that we leave afterwards so that they know that the actual um, exchange has occurred. Uh, again, we attending community meetings, more email communication, employee training, and just education, and again, dealing, working with our media and, and social media throughout. And I just really want to point out that our customer education materials were, are all created in English and Spanish, and I think that's extremely key that everything that we do is in both languages. Again, this is just kind of a recap of what the bullet points we're discussing, but really the one I want to highlight is that we attended 36 community meetings and events in 2023 in Texas and New Mexico, and we've already reached or attended at least one community event or community meeting in all optimization areas that we listed from one through seven. And the, the report that we filed, you can actually see every single place that we've been, and this this year already we've been, I would say, five different locations, and this is our month, especially during Earth Month, when we'll start being at more locations worldwide, citywide. So here are just some of the phase one awareness campaigns that we had in place. And you can see we had the, the door hangers, we have the mailing, we have digital banners, um, what the smart meter is gonna look like, and all of these are interactive, so you can click on them and see what they are. And there you see the installation smart process. Smart meters at our, really put the oh, power in the hands of our customers. this next page. So the phase one, again, these are the door hangers that we're leaving at residents. Um, homes and then the the actual postcards that are going out to people's homes letting them know that we'll be at their home within 30 to 60 days of installation uh, this is our uh, a screenshot of our smart meter website where you can go enter in your zip code and it'll let you know when we're going to go and I think what's really key in this on this page again it's in English and Spanish it's for Texas and New Mexico and it also, the explainer video of what the installation process looks like is really, really key and important for us to, to have because a lot, we get a lot of questions about what that process is gonna look like. I think the smart meter explain, explainer video will play next, let's see. Maybe not, do I need to click it? What do I do? Starting in spring 2023, El Paso Electric is replacing your current meter with smart meter technology. This is the awareness video. A smart meter is so much more than a digital meter. It gives you the power to control your energy use, giving you more control over your energy costs. Through a simple online portal, you'll have the power to take advantage of many smart meter benefits. You'll have the option to track your energy use in near real time and make simple adjustments. It's all there on your dashboard. You can also sign up to receive customized energy saving tips and bill alerts. So you can stay within budget and save money on your electric bill. With smart meters, you've got the power. Coming to your home or business starting in spring 2023. So that is our awareness video that we had. I do want to play, this is the one I meant to play, I'm sorry. This is the installation process. Get ready to say hello to the future of energy with smart meters. El Paso electric smart meter installations are underway and will continue through 2025. 
Prior to installation, make sure there's adequate clearance around your current meter. On installation day, our meter installers will be easy to spot with their Texas meter and device and El Paso electric badges, complete with unique ID numbers. They will never request payment, personal information, or account information. The work will be completed in less than 15 minutes and your power will be turned off during this time to ensure the safety of the workers. You don't need to be present during the installation, but if you are at home, installers will announce themselves when they arrive. They will also leave a door hanger, indicating whether the meter was changed out. You can find out when smart meters are coming to your area by entering your zip code on the EPE Smart Meter website. Once you have your new smart meter, remember to create an online account with El Paso Electric. You can also manage your account by downloading the El Paso Electric app. With smart meter technology, you can track your energy use in near real time, giving you the power to save energy and money. For more information, visit epelectric.com slash smart meters. So that video is extremely important to us because we want to make sure our customers know what the installation process is going to look like. Um, but I think a key point of this video as well is the, the issue that we get when we're out in community events and community meetings is the issue about scams. We want to make sure that customers are aware that we will not come to your door, we will not ask you for money because we actually have seen that already being reported to us. That you know when we have such a wide distributed media campaign, ed educational campaign, there are going to be scammers out there taking advantage of our customers. And so we've already heard that, that people have come to their door, asked them to pay a certain amount of money regarding their installation or to change out their meter. And since they've heard something about it, they don't question it and have actually had some of our customers pay that amount. So we just want to make sure that that is really key when we're out in the community, making sure that they're aware that that is not something that El Paso Electric will do. No, not the next one. Let's see. I'm going to have you here all day watching videos. I can't move forward. Let's see. Mm, there we go. El Paso Electric is proud to present the Okay. I won't have you watch this one, but this is the installer's commercial. So we wanted to do something really, really different that really got the attention of our customers because we wanted to make sure that they were aware that we are going to be installing a new meter in their home. So we created the installer's educational campaign. Um, so I don't know. I'm curious to hear your thoughts. But, I mean, it is something that did get a lot of people's attention um, when we did it because it's something that's really, really different. Um, so, so yeah, we're just we're we're proud of the different kind of campaign that we're trying to do with with this approach. And we do have the guitar if you guys want to see it. We'll bring it next time. Okay, go. Well, there you go. <laughs> so something that you know we're we're trying to track, and you know this is our first year, and we'll have more numbers as we continue to roll out more meters. But this is what, something that we're really really trying to push is that we want our customers to make sure that they download the EP app that they go to our website, that they click on the Manage My Account and actually go into the portal. So the portal is the Manage My Account on our website. And what that basically does is it provides you with the smart energy tools that are related to a smart meter. So you can see um, neighborhood comparisons. Um, but the most important one is the home energy analysis. But here what it does is it breaks down the, op the optimization areas by the number of meters and then how many people in that optimization area are actually logging into the portal. So as you can see, some of the percentages are higher than others. Some areas were not even in that optimization area yet, um, but those numbers are, are still fairly high. But that is something that we're going to be monitoring very, very closely. And as you'll, you'll see in the next slide of what our next steps campaign will be. So 2024 considerations. So we are, we're actually have already launched our next steps campaign since this is a report for 2023. But we've already launched our next steps with 200,000 meters, smart meters already out in our service area. We want to make sure, like, what do you do next? What do you do? Like, so we want to make sure that customers are aware that they need to download the app, go to their manage their account, look at the smart energy tools, but most importantly, really take that free home energy analysis because that's what's going to provide them with customized energy efficiency saving tips or just energy t ener energy saving tips that they can do and, and perform in their own home. So I think that's going to be really key 
We've also rolled out what are called the weekly AMI reports, advanced metering infrastructure. So weekly smart meter reports basically that show you your previous week's consumption. Um, right now those are going out on Thursday mornings. So we need to have, make sure that we have your email address as well in, in, our, in our system so we can get those reports. And those come in really handy. So for myself, on a Sunday is when I use the most electricity. So I know that and it tells me about what time frame. And that's usually when I'm washing on Sundays and you can see that increase. So when we roll out some, some different pilot rates, then you can kind of now you have better idea of where you might fit into those, those pilot rates. And again, that's coming later on in this year that we'll come back and report on. Um, we're also focusing on like the hard to, our hard to reach communities. So we've been in Clint, Canutillo. We're gonna be at the Grace Christian Church Health Fair on April 6th. Um, we've met with Promotoras as well. Uh, we connected with Ayuda Inc. Um, that's out in Fabens, Horizon, um, Clint as well, so that we can actually go door to door with, partner with them to go door to door to make sure that they get that information because everyone's meter is getting replaced. So we just encourage you all, if you all have a community event or a meeting and we haven't presented, then we would love to be there. Um, if you have a community event that you think we should be at, then just let us know. Um, get with Daniel and he'll show up wearing our LED mascot for sure or whichever one you want him to wear but yeah that's really our ask of you all is whatever community event that you all may have you want us to be at we, we will be there so you'll see a lot of you'll see us everywhere especially during earth month and we're partnering with the city and with the county on all of these efforts thank you thank you now my first question is i know that uh, when we talked about it originally people had the opportunity to opt out but uh, it was a costly proposal really to opt out have you seen people after doing the online training and everything all I've done because I see a, a huge outreach uh, have you seen a very minimal amount of people opt out yes um, in Texas out of um, the 150,000 customers that we have we have received 73 customers that have opted that's out that's it that's, wow, that's it. great um, we've received calls and once we educate them about the you know the benefits that this technology offers on um, um, as of today those are the numbers that we have that's really good so that's, I mean I was looking at the numbers of your you know proactive reaching out and, and talking to people also the next question is <laughs> so this uh, new metering is supposed to help me be able to gauge my usage and to maximize and save money have you been able to determine how much an average are people saving based on that? No, it, it is our intent. However, we need data in order to compare, you know, a year of, of usage versus the previous year um, before and after um, a, a smart meter installation. So that's, that's one of the intents that we, once we reach another year for the first customers that we have installed, we're gonna be calculating, estimating. It's, uh, I'm gonna say, um, it's going to be a little tough because there's a lot of factors uh, that come into this play um, for that calculations, weather, um, you know, different changes in their household. But um, we'll try to, with different algorithms, we'll try to identify uh, the benefits of, of, um, of having these uh, customers looking at their energy use and how that impacted their, their reducing their bill. No, and I understand that, and I think mm -hmm. it's going to be really hard to gauge because cost of energy changes. You know, mm -hmm. hopefully here soon it'll be start going down instead of up. But uh, yeah, I see that uh, it changes. So when you gauge based on that, but I, I, I think it'd be really interesting to see mm -hmm. that based on everyone that's signed up and having the opportunity to utilize and maximize the savings and look at your usage i think it'd be really interesting to see what type of savings people are starting to, to see on their bills so maybe you know within the next six months or something if we could get some type of um, report it'd be kind of neat to see and hopefully it'll be a savings because that's what we talked about mm -hmm. when we talked about bringing this into the market yeah, one of the analytics that we implemented as part of the project is the load disaggregation. When we classify, just like your bank statement, that classify your expenses in gasoline, groceries, and uh, online shopping, we have the same, but for energy use, like lighting, um, your washer and dryer, your HVAC. So we probably are going to have to compare those um, 
those energy classifications on like factors that that do not have to do much with weather because I mean weather is a huge impact. So we'll in six months we'll we'll come back here and 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 let you know about. Well, I'd like to I look forward to seeing that because I think based on everything I've seen, I think you'll see some savings. So thank you for that. Representative Fierro followed by Representative Hernandez. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, first and foremost, thank you very much for the, the presentations. It uh, was very helpful. I think, like the mayor said, it's going to be able to help and save um, consumers money, which is always great. Uh, I wanted to give kudos, though, to Daniel, uh, Mr. Perez. Uh, <laughs> yesterday, when, when we were in the midst of the power outages and the, the winds, he was on his phone texting us and, and making sure that he was available for any questions, concerns, or complaints. So thank you, Mr. Perez. Thank you, Mayor. <laughs> thank you, sir. Representative Hernandez, followed I'll by I'll just say real quick, uh, shout out to our crews who were out there, uh, you know, uh, even even over the overnight and this morning and in inclement weather, but thank you, Rep. Peter, appreciate that. And you know what, then, just uh, before I go to Representative Hernandez, uh, that's a great point, Representative Ferro, because I know you reached out to our office and said we're out there if you guys hear anything you need us to take care of and please let us know because we're out here and we understand that uh, the conditions so again it's kudos and thank yous to y'all for that thank you we're setting on this i did get the call as well i thought i was the only one just, just kidding. um you're all special <laughs> uh, i love the video that's my opinion i would have preferred a intocable type of style video <laughs> we talked about that um, but it's a it's a it's a funny um, oh it's a and Tucable is a it's a Mexican band it's really popular in El Paso. Um, George loves them. Yeah, <laughs> do you really? <laughs> uh, you have the dance down and everything. So related to um, the the change in software, are you all changing software for El Paso electric customers as well? Because I heard about some of the concerns of Las Cruces folks not getting their energy bills, is that the same problem that's happening in El Paso? And if so, what is the reasoning behind um, that discrepancy? Um, well, this had, um, they had um, we, before this project, we implemented our, um, a new customer, customer billing system. So along with that, we made adjustments to this new customer billing system to take these interval data. These, um, you know, before it used to be one monthly read. Now these are for residential customers is every 15 minute read and for commercial is five minute read. So we had to adjust um, our billing um, for that, uh, for, for taking that, that much data. So um, we have to say that um, of course, is a deployment. We're installing uh, several large number of meters a day, and they all have different situations. You know, depending on the time, depending of how this customer was. Um, you know, the the billing window that we had. Sometimes, uh, yes, we do have problems. Uh, however, we're monitoring these problems. Uh, we think. Um, that percentage uh, of no bills due to AMS impact, it's low at this time, and we're managing. Um, yeah, we had to do some conf uh, changing configuration for to take on on um, on, on meet or solar meter. So when installing solar meters, so while we wait for these um, changing configuration in the system, we did had a, a month or two in delays for some of the customers. Okay. But the numbers well, let me try to understand low. the is it the entire El Paso customer base or is it just some the entire folk? customer okay. um, uh, service territory. Yeah. Uh, let me just talk about the obvious concerns here because we're gonna my fear is is that during the time that we are asking for a rate case um, yeah. that this issue pops up. When we have customers who are living paycheck to paycheck and are like you know they might be on a automatic payment plan i'm not an automatic payment plan because of these specific reasons uh like to make sure that i pay directly on time mm -hmm. in the future uh, i'm <laughs> laughing at daniel because i always have problems with the the online system but when uh our customers are depending on the automatic payment and then they just unintentionally do not get their electric bill as a result of El Paso Electric's error in their software, we're going to be in a position where they're going to have a hardship and not being able to pay back. So are you all um, looking at customer payment plans, number one? Number two, don't want to hear that the ratepayers are responsible to pay for this because this is your fault. 
um, and, and I'm not pointing to you, but when we have a discussion about uh, Ray cases, I can almost assure you this is going to be a topic of discussion because I have seen these issues um, come back in the future. So I want to make sure on the record that I want, I want to make sure that this is fixed, that customers um, who are experiencing hardship are given an opportunity for a payment plan, and that you have an internal process on how to identify that and notify customers before they go too far beyond their ability to pay back those fees. Yeah. Um, well, let me first clarify, um, the ch uh, this is already fixed, has been addressed, and um, these, um, that, like I said, this these, uh, problem only happened to a very low number of customers. Um, so the change of the work that we, in configuration, it sounds um, fancy, but it's not. It was a, a very simple simple change so um, again as part of this project we build contingency and we are not exceeding the project costs due to this problem and this part of deployment I mean we're touching every customer and um, you know we have to be very uh, we have to monitor and track everything that um, has happened due to these changes in exchanging changes so uh, we are tracking uh, we I mean, we we have it un under control, but I'll let George. Um, yeah, George I'd like to. I'd like to hear a little bit letter. about what your protections are for customers. Yeah, and, so we send out a letter plans. to every yeah. customer uh, that we're experiencing uh, oh, I'm this sorry. delay. I don't know if you guys are trying to chime in. <laughs> Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, and Ingrid said was was hitting right on it. So we sent a notification to every customer affected by that, and of course, if if it leads to several months uh, of of you know, of bills that are accumulating, absolutely, there's there's always going to be um, pay payment plans and all sorts of options for those customers, right? We would we would not put, especially a, an issue caused by us, um, we we would not um, disconnect anybody or, 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 or force them to pay a lump sum if it was a meter issue. So, absolutely, um, they, like you said, was saying we already sent a letter to those customers, and and we're we're working with with every single account to figure out uh, what. The, the actual issue is and, and being as diligent as possible to get it fixed immediately. And, and it, it was because of the AMS? No. Oh, so but the original customer service base? So, yeah, so yeah. we, like you said, was saying last year we did a, 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 a an upgraded, because mm -hmm. I go by the acronym, it's CCS, but it, we, we upgraded our software, mm -hmm. our billing software, and so um, the vast majority of the cases are tied to that still that we're, 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 we're working through. but. Like, like again, like you said, we're replacing 1,400 meters a day, so um, we are seeing some glitches, but we're we're addressing them as fast as possible. Okay, so this is a customer isolated. service software issue, not unrelated to AMS, but once AMS is installed, then the issue may come to surface, mm, totally. or is it 100% mm. on the customers on the mm. software? It's kind of s several factors at once type of thing, but yeah. um, no, we we foresee it getting getting fixed Understood. pretty soon, yeah. Anything else? <laughs> Thank you. That's all my questions. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Representative Acevedo followed by Representative Molinard. Uh, well, thank you for um, kind of reviewing this uh, a few days ago with me. Um, it was it was good. And I think that one, one thing that um, we kind of talked about was kind of the unintended consequences of now having these smart meters. I think they're they're great, right? But it's a lot easier to cut people's services off because it's just a push of a button at this point. So I'm I'm just kind of I've been playing around with the with the system to kind of see how it works, right? And so one question that I have is when a customer pays their bill. Um, how long does it, uh, they paid online through bill matrix? Like how, how long does it take for your system to know that that was paid? And the reason that I'm asking is cause I, I paid my bill on the 17th and then on the 22nd, which was Friday, um, I got a bill that I was overdue and I had already paid, um, the, the bill. Right. And so I should have still owed like another $30, but that was going to move all over to the next billing cycle or whatever that was. So I kind of did that intentionally just to kind of gauge it. And I'm kind of wondering that in that sense. So, um, and I'll look at your account specifically. I'll make sure we, we, we look at that. But um, yeah, I mean, ideally, and I do know that we have, you know, if, if there's a disconnection um, 
and, and folks call us, they make payment at that time. There's, there's been already stories of people on the phone with us while their power comes on, right? Which was not the case back in the day, right? Because we had to mobilize a, a, a truck to, to, your, to your house and, and get them back on. So um, one of the things I, I did want to, and, and I, don't, I don't think we touched on it, but um, we're identifying, to your point about unintended consequences in a good way, um, we can, if you move, if you change address, we can get you back on that much more quickly. We've also been identifying instances of theft more quickly, of people messing around with their meters, things like that. So, um, but yes, I will uh, have our customer care folks look at your account. And it's not really just on me. Like I, I'm, I'm caring more about like how long will it take for your system to know that that payment was made online to not have to send a, another bill, it, right? And and that was like pretty immediate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that 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 was five business days later, and I still got that. So I, I I think figuring that out would probably be good. That way, people are getting the most accurate representation, and they're not gonna panic when they see that. Like, oh, did my bill not come through? Right. I, I obviously took a screenshot, and I have the confirmation number and all that. But somebody else might be really um, worried about that. So it's it's causing some duress or something. And that's where I I worry about that. Um, and then I guess the other thing that um. We, we have the new thing um, in place as of the last council meeting, so I just wanted to disclose that I got 750 from the employee pack, the El Paso Electric employee pack. So I just wanted to add that to the record. That's all I have. Thank you, sir. Uh, Representative Molinard, followed by Representative Canales. Thank you very much, Mayor. Thank you very much, everyone, for your hard work and appreciate you being here today. I'm gonna to go to slide five. Uh, Anyways, it does show 79924, approximately 26,000 customers or homes, I guess, and uh, 79934 for a total of approximately 38,000 houses. And so is that safe to say, because District 4 only has two zip codes, 79924, 79934. So is that, would that be safe to say that District 4 has been completely installed with the new smart meters or no? Or is there still something pending? Okay. In area one, we're about 90% complete. And in area two, we're about 70% uh, complete. Uh, we can give you um, a report on, on your two zip codes and to, okay. give, to so give you a better- So there's still some, some uh, customers pending then? Yes, yeah, um, uh, for area one, we had, you know, this is an, old, an older area where the meters are inside the houses yeah. and we have to schedule appointments with them to in order, um, you know, to get inside the premise. So that's what has taken us um, the longest. Right now we have about 7,000 meters still um, that we're waiting on these appointments. So okay, yeah, just when I added the both up, it's approximately 38,000 houses, so I know there's more than that in District 4. So... Um, once seven, again, Daniel. I'm sorry, ma'am. Uh, you said 79934 and 20. 79924 and 79934. 34. Okay. If you can get that, that would be great, ma'am. Yes. And Daniel has all my contact information. So once again, Daniel, thank you very much for reaching out yesterday. Um, I know there was one power outage that I'm aware of at the 10700 block of Russian near Russian and Sean Haggerty. Okay. Do you have any way of knowing is that reported through a smart meter? Was, was it satisfied or pending or? No, we can look into. Yeah, we can definitely look into that. But all of the outages that were that occurred yesterday have, were all restored yesterday. So if, in theory, if uh, the smart meters have been installed and they were working correctly. You would have been El Paso Electric would have been notified in a timely manner. Hey, we have an outage in this area, this specific area, depending on what size it was. Correct. So prior <laughs> to smart meters, we 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 only had visibility down to the substation level. So your individual home, we did not know unless you gave us a call. Whereas now, we know down to the individual meter who's out, who's on, um, or who's off. So um, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, and for if for. You know, after that repair, we check back in the system that everyone is back connected, that there's not uh, any customers left behind, so. Okay, well, like I said, this was approximately the 10700 block of Rushing, Rushing and Sean Haggerty. Um, how many customers have downloaded the uh, smart meter app? Do you have any data on that? I, I should. No, we'll definitely get, we'll definitely get that to you. I mean, are, we, uh, is it, are you seeing a trend where people are actually downloading the app to mm -hmm. 
maximize everything that's being installed and worked on. Yes, and one of the slides. <laughs> and, and, and while you're looking at that, <laughs> uh, this is it, right? The virtual portal. So it's slide 18. That one shows the percentage in each of our areas that have um, created a customer account and are looking at their portal. But okay. more specifically to the app, we can definitely get you that number because we do track that on a okay. monthly basis. It's about 60,000 is what I'm hearing. From okay, the crowd. great. Uh, and how are you doing uh, apartment complexes? The same way. The same way? Mm -hmm. So if you had an apartment complex that had 30 units, uh, you the vendor would have to go out there and install 30 different meters? Correct. Mm -hmm. Or if there are 220 units, they would have to install 220 units? Every meter. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what are you doing with the old meters? What is El Paso Electric doing with the old meters? They're we, being recycled or what? Yes, they're being recycled. And um, we get a salvage cost, which uh, it, it was also part of um, the reduction in the project cost. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Canales. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, I'm a user of the portal. Uh, I think ever, ever since the meter was installed, I've checked it kind of obsessively. I don't know exactly why. <laughs> I really like the amount of data that it gives you. Um, we've gotten some good insights. I have a family member who works from home one day a week, and uh, the usage is almost <laughs> double on that day, so I know you who to scold. You can see the impact. <laughs> so it has an impact, exactly. Um, it's good to be able to know when the usage is coming. I, I mostly also just wanted to thank Daniel yesterday for reaching out. Um, I had an outage at my house. And actually, it was not that long after he texted me, and by the time I was able to text him back, it was restored. So it was a it was a really quick outage, um, and I know you had crews out everywhere, so they were able to get it up really quickly within minutes. Um, and uh, we'll, I'll take advantage of uh, inviting you to one of my uh, community meetings soon. You don't have to wear one of the full costumes, but you do have to. <laughs> you do have to grow the Ernie G. Watts mustache. <laughs> it's El Paso's it's the only mustache, mustache I can grow. No, yeah. have you seen your uh, Thursday mornings? We're sending out. If we have your email, and maybe some mm -hmm. of you already also are, are receiving it, I, I'm sure. Uh, but we send a weekly. The newsletter. Yeah, but yeah. but well, it, it gives you your 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 usage for that week. week. Yeah, and it's 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 very. I don't know. I'm I'm geeking out about it too. So. Yeah, not a newsletter. It's like a personalized Correct. usage email, and it's yeah, it's great. Uh, kind of clicks you through to the portal too, and that's mm -hmm. that's how I'm accessing it most of the time. So, thank you. I appreciate the the smoothness of the of the rollout. I've heard from my constituents like some of them were very apprehensive about it. Mm -hmm. um, they were surprised at how quick the the changeover happened, the installation of the new meter, and everything has mostly been smooth. Again, I've like others. I've heard from a few folks who had some sort of account discrepancy, mostly not related to this, as I, you know, I understand you've explained related to the change in the billing system. But it seems like those have all been resolved pretty smoothly. So um, we'll, we'll continue to send those your way if they come up, but uh, please do. Yeah, I please. appreciate the, the quick work to resolve all of those. So, yeah, because you, mostly they're one-offs, and mm -hmm. we, we just have to go through each of every case. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Ms. Pratt, and thank you all for being here, and thank okay. you for thank you. sharing that great information. And uh, I'll put you down for six months from now, Daniel. Thank you. <laughs> Happy to do it. <laughs> thank you. Thank guys. you. The guitar. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. That brings us to item number six, and this is discussion and action on a resolution scheduling standing work sessions in accordance with the El Paso Municipal Charter. And, and Mayor and Council, I, I asked for this item to be put on the agenda to go back to a work session prior to each of our council meetings. I think we're seeing a, an increase in the number of presentations that we as a staff need to bring to all of you. And as we're getting into the height of the budget season, I think the time is right for us to do that for your consideration. Which is right after the 21 items in executive session. <laughs> is there Representative Canales? 
Yeah, just really quickly. I, I still do have some, I guess it's concern. Uh, frankly, it's about wasted time. You know, we, we have the work session, no problem with that. Uh, but preceding that, we usually have an agenda review meeting. And I felt over the years that these agenda review meetings have uh, lessened in, in the value that they bring us. Um, you know, today, staff, you know, we had uh, dozens of members of staff here to give very preliminary presentations. They're going to be back tomorrow to present. It uses a lot of their time. And I, I'm pretty sure collectively on those uh, presentations today, we asked a total of zero questions of staff. And so, again, I'm okay with doing this now, but I just want to keep evaluating into the future how, how effective those meetings are, the agenda review meetings. Motion to approve. Second. Uh, par pardon me, I still have oh, the floor. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no. Um, and and uh, I think that if the we don't see that there's a lot of engagement during these meetings into the future, we should consider uh, another amendment here to potentially cancel those. Well, and the point isn't just for the agenda review. However, it will be more consistent in providing a, an agenda review prior to each of the council meetings. And the whole p purpose for me is to not necessarily you don't have to fill the entire day with, with presentations either, but if there's timely presentations that we can give that'd be more appropriate for a, a work session as opposed to a council meeting, it gives us a little more flexibility to be able to do that twice a month Absolutely. as opposed yeah, to Yeah, no, no, I, I love the work session meetings. I think they give us a great opportunity to have deeper conversation and longer presentations and again, separating the, or you know, splitting the, uh, the executive session items in into two different weeks instead of one week a month will be really helpful in terms of the amount of time. It's just the agenda review that's, to me, not necessarily adding a ton of value to our meetings. Thank you, Representative Cornelius. Can, can I address council? Yes, ma'am. The other request um, that I did speak to the city manager about is to add the, the work session, as you all are seeing, a larger number of executive session items, and that is happening because we like to preserve the Monday work session for executive session items simply because traditionally your Tuesday uh, regular council meetings have about 45 to 50 items which take us well into the afternoon so then to still add you know a large number of executive session items puts us way, way into the evening and I don't know that it's the best use of council's time especially because uh, the items that we're asking you to consider are um, usually quite large and requires a lot of time from staff to brief you all. Um, so that was another request why I would ask that the council consider adding another work session because it does give us the flexibility to put most items on a Monday work session and get through all the executive session items. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Neiman. And with that, we have a motion and a second. Yes, Mayor, the motion was made by Representative Fierro, seconded by Alternate Mayor Pro Tem Molinar, and this is to approve item number six. On that motion, call for the vote. Representative Fierro? Aye. Thank you. In the voting session, and the motion passes seven to one. Representative Acevedo voting nay. The motion carries. Is there a motion to retire into executive session? I'd like to uh, also take a lunch break at this time so we don't cut in between and, uh, and return at one o'clock. Is so. there a motion, motion to recess, recess motion, motion. and retire into executive session at one o'clock? Pardon me, ma'am? One. Yes, ma'am. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. There's a motion and a second to recess a city council meeting until 1 o'clock and then retire into executive session. All in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? And the work session is in recess until 1 o'clock. And then at 1 o'clock, the city council will retire into executive session pursuant to section 3.5A of the El Paso City Charter and the Texas Government Code Chapter 551 Subchapter D to discuss any of the following executive session item one, claim of Mario Avalos, PL number 22-1026-12095 under 551.071. Executive session item two, claim of Patricia Mondreal, poll claims 261 under 551.071. Executive session item three, claim of Audra M. Rodriguez, claim 287 
under 551.071. Executive session item four, claim of, of Teresa Nicole Friday, claim 273 under 551.071. Executive session item five, claim of Leah Garrett on behalf of wrongful death of Daniel Thurman, claim 323 under 551.071. Executive session item six, claim of Desiree Mora, PL number 22-1005-11773 under 551.071. Executive session item seven, Luis R. Varela versus City of El Paso, cause number 2021, DCV 1549, PL number 21-1007-2727. Executive session item eight, Texas Legislative Special Session 88, four Senate Bill four, related to illegal entry or presence in this state under 551.071. Executive session item nine, Albert Lopez and Lex B. Lopez versus City of El Paso, matter number 17-1036-1318 under 551.071. Executive session item 10, JAR Concrete Bankruptcy, HQ number 23-578 under 551.071. Executive session item 11, application of El Paso Electric Company, to update its generation cost recovery rider related to Newman Unit 6, PUC number 56225, HQ number utility-31 under 551.071. Executive session item 12, application of El Paso Electric Company for approval of its Texas Electric Vehicle Ready Pilot Programs and Tariffs, PUC number 54614, HQ number utility-2 under 551.071. Executive session item 13, Texas Gas Service Company, a division of One Gas Inc.'s test year 2023. Gas Reliability Infrastructure Program Interim Rate Adjustment for the Incorporated Areas of the West North Service Area. Utility-33 under 551.071. Executive Session Item 14. Discussion regarding the purchase, exchange, lease, or value of real property located in Central El Paso, HQ number 24-2200 under 551.071 and 551.072. Executive session item 15, discussion regarding the purchase, exchange, lease, or value of real property located in East El Paso, HQ number 24-2201, under 551.071 and 551.072. Executive session item 16, discussion regarding the purchase, exchange, lease, or value of real property located outside the city limits of the city of El Paso, HQ number 24-2203, under 551.071 and 551.072. Executive session item 17, discussion the regarding the purchase, exchange, lease, or value of real property located in El Paso, HQ number 24-2276 under 551.071 and 551.072. Executive session item 18, close out of 2012 license agreement with the El Paso Zoological Society under 551.071. Executive session item 19, discussion on potential, potential economic development Opportunities in Northwest El Paso, HQ number 24-2396, under 551.072 and 551.087. Executive session item 20, discussion on potential economic development opportunities in Northeast El Paso. Texas HQ number 23-1857, under 551.072 and 551.087. And executive session item 21, discussion on purchase, exchange, lease, or value of real property located in downtown El Paso, matter number 16-1040-1083.046 and HQ number 23-495 under 551.071 and 551.072. These, these items are taken into executive session under 551.071, consultation with attorney, 551.072, deliberation regarding real property, and 551.087, deliberation regarding economic development negotiations. It is 11.41 a.m. and City Council will reconvene in executive session at 1 o'clock p.m.